Um, we've received apologies from Jennifer Moran O'Connor and also from um, our Chair Ma Michael McNamara, who we obviously congratulate on um, his um, election to the European Parliament. Um, and we've had no other apologies so far. Um, in relation to privilege, parliamentary privilege is considered to apply to the utterances of members participating online and in a committee meeting when their participation is from within the parliamentary precincts. There can be no assurances in relation to participation online from outside the parliamentary precincts, and members should be mindful of this when they are contributing. Um, I'd like to welcome um, all the, the, the witnesses here today. The topic of our meeting is drug use policy, the national drug strategy and a whole of government approach. I'd like to welcome the Department of Health, which are represented by Assistant Secretary Ms Siobhan McCardle, Mr Tyag Fallon, Mr Brian Dowlin and Ms Mary uh, Jane Trimble. And the Department of Justice, represented by Mr. Ben Ryan, who is Head of Policy for Criminal Justice, and also the HSE, which is represented by Dr. Eamon Keenan, National Clinical Lead, HSE Addic uh, Addiction Services, Ms. Martina Queeley, uh, Regional Executive Officer, Dublin South and East, Mr. Joe Dial, National Lead, National Social Inclusion Office. Um, I have pronounced, pronounced um, Martina's name correctly, yeah? Que Queeley? Yeah. Um, you are all very welcome here today, and, and I invite Ms McArdle to give her opening statement on behalf of the Department of Health. Uh, thank you, Ms McArdle. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on drugs policy, the implementation of the current national drug strategy, and to outline the plans for the successor strategy as outlined in the recommendations of the Citizens Assembly on Drugs Use. The government's policy on drug use is set out in the National Drug Strategy, Reducing Harm, Supporting Recovery, which covers the period 2017 to 2025. The central tenet of the strategy is that drug use should be dealt with as a public health issue. It advocates for a compassionate response to individuals who use drugs. The programme for government reiterates the health-led approach to drug use. The shift to a health-led approach to drug use continues to evolve. Drug use is a dynamic situation to which policy must adapt in a flexible manner. It is for this reason the Department undertook a mid-year review of the National Drug Strategy in 2021, which identified six strategic priorities for the remaining period of the strategy. A two-year strategic action plan containing 34 actions is now being implemented, which will run to the end of 2024. The strategic priorities include prevention of drug use among children and young people, access to and delivery of drug services in the community, harm reduction responses and integrated care pathways for high-risk drug users, the social determinants of health and the consequences of drug use, alternatives to coercive sanctions for drug offences and the performance overall of the strategy. Underpinning the strategy is public expenditure of over 250 million euro across all government departments, based on 2022 figures. The bulk of this funding, at over 160 million, was from the Department of Health for the provision of drug services. The department has allocated an additional 13.5 million euro in 2023 and 2024 to support existing services and to develop new services in the community. Approximately one third of this funding is allocated to community and voluntary organisations. A key strategic priority is to enhance access to and delivery of drug services in the community. Demand for and access to services has increased during the period of the current strategy. Most recent data indicates that there was a 33% increase in the number of cases entering treatment for problematic drug use. Another measure to improve access is the Department's recent publication of an interactive map of 442 publicly funded services across Ireland. The next step is to audit current service provision based on treatment demand and population need to inform the planning of drug services in the new HSE health regions. A further action in the strategy is the implementation of the Health Diversion Scheme, whereby people found in the possession of drugs for personal use are diverted from the criminal justice system to a health response. The Departments of Health and Justice have agreed the scheme and are now consulting with key stakeholders, including the Director of Public Prosecutions, prior to a national rollout. 
The implementation of the scheme will be subject to a formal review after one year to allow any necessary changes to meet the aims of the scheme. Implementation of the National Drug Strategy is overseen by the National Oversight Committee and six strategic <coughs> implementation groups. These groups comprise a wide range of stakeholders, including government departments, civil society, drugs task forces, and independent experts. Minister of State Colin Burke provides political leadership for the strategy, and the Cabinet Committee for Social Affairs and Public Services, chaired by the Taoiseach, provides government oversight. Turning now to the successor national drug strategy, the Department of Health welcomes the comprehensive report from the Citizens' Assembly on drugs use, which further develops the health-led approach to drugs use. We acknowledge that full implementation of the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly will require a major step change in how the state responds to drug use. The report of the Citizens' Assembly was the focus of Ireland's pledge for action at the recent meeting of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs in March 2024. The pledge commits to carefully consider and respond with urgency to the Assembly's recommendations for reform of the legislative, policy and operational approach to drugs use, and to indicate the time frame for implementing the recommendations which it accepts. It is proposed to prepare a first draft of the new National Drug Strategy in quarter one 2025, informed by an evaluation of the current Strategic Action Plan, the government response to the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly, and the 800 submissions made to the Citizens' Assembly. This time frame will also allow consideration of the deliberations of this joint committee. Finally, I want to highlight the importance of coordinating drug policy in a multilateral manner. Ireland actively contributes to international bodies on drugs policy, including the British Irish Council, the European Union, and the new drugs agency and the Council of Europe. Indeed, Ireland will have a leading role in promoting a person-centred and human rights approach in EU drugs policy when we assume the presidency in the second half of 2026. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Um, I now invite Mr Ryan to give his opening statement on behalf of the Department of Justice. Thank you, Gahirla, and thanks to the committee for inviting me in. Um, my name is Ben Ryan. I'm Head of Criminal Justice Policy um, within the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is fully committed to helping significantly reduce the harms caused to families and communities by illicit drug use. The three main policy objectives we are seeking to achieve in this area are tackling organised crime, minimising the harms caused to those with addiction issues, and diverting people from involvement in crime and illicit drug-related activity. These areas are complex and often interlinked. For example, a person with an addiction issue may also be involved in the sales and supply of drugs or have close associations with those involved in organised crime. It's well established that organised criminal groups will exploit vulnerable people uh, and coerce or groom them into being involved in criminality. It's important to recognise that the actions underway in relation to this area must be viewed holistically. There's no single policy solution which can resolve all the harms caused to society by the use of illicit drugs. The stark reality of drug use in Ireland today means this work is a high priority for our department. We have a particular focus on targeting the work of organised crime groups, which inflict intimidation and violence on families and communities while grooming and coercing vulnerable young people into drug-related criminal activity. The Minister for Justice has recently brought forward new laws to allow for the prosecution of those involved in grooming and coercing young people into criminal activity. The Criminal Justice Engagement of Children and Criminal Activity Act 2024 makes it an offence for an adult to compel, coerce, direct or deceive a child for the purpose of committing crime, with those found guilty potentially liable to face up to five years in prison. And that's in addition to uh, potentially facing um, a sentence for what the actual crime itself that's being committed by the young person. So there's an additional penalty on top of that to, to recognise the harm done to children in such circumstances. There's a programme currently operating in two trial sites, uh, colloquially known as the Greentown Pro programme, uh, and the tri trial sites are known as um, White Town and Yellow Town. And this targets those young people who've been groomed into criminal gangs already and provides them and their families with supports to help them move away from criminality. This is an innovative intervention which aims to frustrate the grooming of children into network-related criminal activities, for example, drug dealing or drug-related intimidation by adults, and provide meaningful and practical routes out for network-involved children. 
The programme was developed in, in partnership with the University of Limerick, with the, the REP team down there, the research evidence into programmes, policy and practice. Uh, it's built on four complementary but distinct programme pillars to respond to the problems presented by criminal networks. The first pillar is the intensive family programme pillar, and the aim of that pillar is to uh, improve family functioning and parenting, and to provide the relevant supports to families who, who want to see their young people uh, move away from um, being drawn into criminal activities. The second pillar is around pro-social opportunities, um, and that's to provide young people with viable options other than selling drugs, uh, and in, largely in communities where there are a limited uh, array of options, I suppose, available to young people in those areas compared to people in other areas. The third pillar is the community efficacy uh, pillar. And this uh, seeks to build the resources of the community to withstand the criminal influence of, um, of organised criminal networks and organised criminal gangs who are operating in their areas. And the fourth and final pillar is the network disruption pillar. And that's aimed at targeting the members of the criminal networks themselves who groom children for crime. The Greentown program is, um, as I said, operating in two trial sites which are anonymised. Um, the reason for anonymising the trial sites is to protect both the young people who are participating in the program and to participate uh, to protect also the the various um, staff members, youth workers, social workers, and so on, who are involved as well given the extent of, of the reach of the criminal gangs in these areas. The community efficacy pillar also includes running a communications campaign to counter the use and sale of illicit drugs, while the network disruption pillar aims to reduce the influence of drug debts and drug-related and drug related intimidation on young people and their families. We've also been working very closely with Angarda Siakana to target serious organised criminal groups who have fled the country and our, we are working closely with our international partners in relation to bringing them to justice and intercepting their operations when drugs are moved into or through this country. The, the second aspect then on reducing harm, um, as we all know, many people with addiction issues live chaotic lives, as a re result of which it can bring them into contact with the, with the criminal justice system. Government policy is to adapt, adopt a human rights-led approach to policing and penal policy, and that includes considering how to reduce the unintended harms our policies and procedures across the criminal justice system may have on those with addiction issues or other vulnerabilities. There are four recommendations in the report of the Citizens' Assembly which relate to the, this dimension of our work. Recommendations 11, 13, 19 and 23 are the recommendations in question and I'm happy to expand on, on, on our response to any of those should the committee wish me to do so. Um, the third strand of our work is in relation to diversion. A significant area of focus in the work of the department is trying to do, divert people, in particular young people, away from involvement in crime and illicit drug related activity. I've mentioned the Greentown programme, but in addition, we also fund youth diversion programmes all around the country. We've expanded the number uh, by adding an additional four uh, youth diversion programmes, with two, two more on the way this year, to ensure that there's full geographical coverage for any child anywhere in the country who needs assistance in, in diverting them away from crime. The funding in relation to uh, youth justice and youth diversion programmes has, has grown substantially. It's effectively trebled since 2014, and it was almost 33 million in, in last year's uh, estimates. Um, recommendations 13, 14, and 17 from this report of the Citizens' Assembly relate to this dimension of our work. And again, I'm able to expand on, on our response to them, should the committee wish me to do so. I'm happy to address any specific questions the committee may have or go into further details on anything I've already mentioned. Thank you, Cahill. Thank you, Mr Ryan. Um, I now invite Ms Creeley <coughs> to give her opening statement on behalf of the HSE. Good morning, Cahill and members. I wish to thank you for the invitation to meet the Joint Committee on Drugs Use and to discuss drug policy, the national drug strategy and whole of government approach. I'm joined, uh, as introduced earlier, by my colleagues, Professor Eamon Keenan, National Clinical Lead for the HSE Addiction Services, and Mr Joe Doyle, National Lead for Social Inclusion uh, Services, and also supported by Ms Sarah Maxwell from the CEO Office of the HSE. My opening statement this morning will provide information in relation to the HC Addiction Services and the work to progress actions identified in our National Drug and Alcohol Strategy Reducing Harm Supporting Recovery. 
particularly the actions as they relate to the recommendations that emerged from the report of the Citizens' Assembly on Drugs Use. The HSC welcomes the publication of that report and its recommendations, and many of its actions are aligned to the ongoing work of the HSC as an organisation. The HSC Addiction Services and Social Inclusion Services are responsible for the delivery of a wide range of treatment interventions um, nationally and for problematic drug use. Uh, the services are, are rolled out across community health organisations, all of which will be um, incorporated into the six new health regions. They work in partnership with community and voluntary sector, and the HSE addiction services operate across various care groups and divisions within the HSE. The service operates in accordance with the HSE corporate plan, annual service plan, which priorities are informed and aligned with the aforementioned national strategy document. To provide a brief overview of the work of the HSE addiction services, it may be useful to highlight some of the key areas that align to the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use. Um, uh, firstly, opioid substitution agonist treatment remains a core component of the HSE harm reduction response to opioid dependence. At the end of 2024, uh, there were 11,385 people on opioid agnostic, uh, ag agonist treatment, OAT, 853 of whom were, rece were receiving buprenorphine-based uh, products, including the new approved injectable form. There were 85 HSE opioid substitution clinics, 266 level 1 GP services, and 89 level 2 GP services, and 759 community pharmacists involved in this scheme. <coughs> and Professor Keenan can give you more detail on these services if required. Uh, addiction treatment is a key area of focus for the service, including those individuals on OAT. It is estimated that approximately 23,000 people annually receive treatment for drug-related issues. The HSE has significantly increased the availability and training with regards to naloxone, a critical harm reduction measure, and in 2023, legislation was amended to allow the HSE to become a recognised trainer, with training modules now incorporated onto HSE land, that's the HSE's online training platform for staff. And since uh, January this year, 977 people have completed Module 1 training and 179 have completed Module 2. In 2023, naloxone was administered to 460 on 461 occasions, um, and that equates, according to international research, on approximately 18 lives being saved. The HSE continues to work with Angora the Shikona um, and uh, are working currently on a, on a pilot programme uh, on naloxine, which hopefully will commence um, uh, later this year. Uh, in addition, cocaine and crack services are now available in each CHO area as a result of funding initiatives in the National Service Plan 2022 and 2023. These are undergoing evaluation to identify areas of best practice uh, so that they can be sustained and scaled. The HSE recognises the importance of medically supervised injecting facilities also uh, as, a, as a major plank in the harm reduction measure. Uh, one such facility is expected to open in quarter four this year at Merchants Quay as a pilot programme. Once operational, the service will be overseen by a monitoring committee and will be subject to evaluation at six month and 18 month intervals uh, to determine effectiveness. Stakeholder engagement in this initiative is ongoing and critical to success, as is the participation of ISCA, ISCA, that's the National Advocacy Service for People Who Use Drugs in Ireland. The recently launched Safer Nightlife Programme 2024 will have a presence at four festivals this year, including back-of-house drug checking and volunteer engagement with attendees. This intervention uh, proved very successful and was a fundamental component of the HSE's response to synthetic opioid, opioid overdose in late 2023. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, we can give you more details on that if required. The HSC Diversion Programme is progressing with involvement from both the Department of Health and the Department of Justice, and the HSC is recruiting nine practitioners nationally to facilitate brief interventions and onward referral utilising the SARE model. Uh, residential services are also uh, critical to addiction treatment, and four residential services in Ireland are provided through both statutory and community and voluntary services. 
the HSE received additional funding of 1.125 million euro through the National Service Plan in 2021 and 900,000 in 2023, um, and we're currently purchasing uh, over 1,000 treatment episodes. The HSE remains committed to the development of a, of a health-led approach to the issue of drug use in Ireland. The HSE recognises that many of the recommendations uh, in the report will support this objective and will complement treatment and harm reduction initiatives already in place. However, in recent years, the European drug market has become increasingly complex, as referenced earlier in the earlier presentations. A concrete example of this has been the emergence of synthetic opioids and the HSE addiction services face significant challenges to respond effectively, requiring ongoing and sustained investment in treatment services. The HSE will continue to engage with all relevant stakeholders, in particular people with lived experience, to ensure that a comprehensive health-led approach is adopted across government and society. At the same time, we are conscious that treatment alone will not address all aspects of this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Creedy. Um, I'd now like to invite the members, and first up is Deputy Mark Ward. You have seven minutes. Well, Chair, <coughs> so I want to thank all the witnesses for coming in today and giving their opening statements as well. And I, I read, I read them before I came into the meeting. With great, great interest. I've, I've, I've worked. I said it before. I've worked in addiction services, frontline addiction services, right across Dublin and outside of Dublin, for numerous years. I've worked in the in HSC facilities. I've also worked in in uh, community-based services as well. I've worked in methadone clinics in both of them as well, in the HSC and say statutory um, methadone clinics, and also <coughs> in community-based methadone clinics. And I have to say, the difference between both is fast. So I think the first questions will be to the HSC. Um, my experience of working in a statutory uh, methadone clinic, I know you call it the, the opioid substitution uh, agonistic treatment, but in, on the ground, it's, it's what we call it colloquially, on the ground. And the difference between in the community and the HSE is fast. My experience within the HSE facilities is get in, get your methadone and get out without any wraparound services whatsoever. The community, in fairness to them, despite limited resources, they try to take a holistic approach in dealing uh, and, and dealing and trying to help people who are on who are on methadone um, methadone substitution program. What's happened over the years is that methadone has turned into a maintenance program. It's just to keep people where, where they are. And in a harm reduction perspective it has its place, but to me it's turned into a be all and and end all end all. And it's really, really difficult for a, a person to take ownership on their own life when they're running into a bureaucratic kind of system that is there to maintain them on methadone. You have to be on a certain amount of methadone to be able to go on a detox. You have to be on, you can't have certain drugs in your system to be able to go on a detox. You can't have whatever it might be. And then if, you, if you're trying to start in, in the community where, you, where, you, where the problems probably begin with, it makes it even more difficult. Like, uh, people that I know well would, would, would describe it as having liquid handcuffs on them, having to be at a certain time, a certain place at a certain time. And if they step out of order or if they have a bad day at a clinic, and I've seen it happening, they are punished. And they are sent into maybe into town, into Trinity Court or one of them places, rather than in their own community. And this is very, very regular. And, and, and it's very hard then to engage with people on a human level when that's what they face on a daily basis. And that's their real life experience, sorry, their real lived experiences. So I have a couple of questions on that. So in the context of the 11,385 people who are currently on an opioid substitution programme, how many are currently on a detox pro pro programme or how many want to be on a, a detox programme? Have that research been done? And the, and the other question I have, in the context of the Citizens' Assembly recommendations, will the HSE consider a move from a primary maintenance programme of methadone to a more recovery-based programme? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, just as was before, I, I will hand over uh, to Professor Keenan uh, just on some of the detail of the question, but just to say we, we, um, we would not condone in any shape any punitive approach to the delivery of services. Uh, as Siobhan said, our, our, our values and our ethos would say that we should be compassionate to people. Um, and also, uh, just on your point on a holistic treatment, that is our ambition, that we would provide holistic uh, treatment to people. Um, uh, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Eamon, if that's all right. Professor sure. Keenan, thank you. Um, thank you, and uh, thanks for the question. 
So I suppose um, if you look at the overall figure that we have in this country in relation to the number of people who would be opioid dependent, there's about just less than 20,000 people have been identified in our last uh, prevalence figures. Uh, and we have about 11,500 of those people on uh, opiate substitution treatment, opiate agonist treatment, which stacks up very well in terms of other European countries, so that we do have a good penetration into the cohort of people who are using opioids. Uh, I don't have an exact figure out of that 11,300 of the number of people who were on uh, detoxification. Uh, but I think it's important to note that methadone treatment is a means of stabilising somebody's uh, lifestyle. So people come into the service uh, in a very chaotic manner. Mm -hmm. uh, they may well have uh, been injecting drugs for a period of time. Uh, they may well have had family difficulties, personal difficulties. They may well have... Uh, uh, viral illnesses such as hepatitis C or HIV, and all of those issues need to be addressed and need to be supported uh, for the individual. The addiction services uh, attempt to do all of that. Uh, we, it's part of our remit is to uh, test people for viruses and to get them engaged in treatment. And one of the big successes we've had recently has been the establishment of treatment services for hepatitis C right across uh, addiction services. So people do need and need to access treatment. In terms of um, moving on, uh, that's not an easy uh, matter for, for individuals to move on uh, because sometimes the facilities within the overall structures aren't there. So while you can detoxify somebody off methadone or off buprenorphine, uh, they may not have a job. They may not have an educational opportunity, they may not have a family support, uh, and they may not have an education, the, the supports that are wrapped around within the community. So that comes to your second point in relation to recovery. And recovery is a whole of society approach to the issue of substance use. So that people who do wish to come off uh, methadone or buprenorphine uh, have the means whereby they can sustain a lifestyle, uh, in a drug-free lifestyle. And what can be very soul destroying for an individual is if they uh, are rushed off a methadone programme or they detoxify too early, they relapse, and sometimes it takes them a while to engage back in treatment mm -hmm. again because they can feel stigmatised, they can feel ashamed that they haven't been successful. So the methadone treatment programme, um, and I suppose one example I give you is uh, a number of years ago we had uh, a pharmacy strike. Uh, and we had to open our services to people who were engaged in community-based pharmacy programmes. Uh, and what we saw was that there was a huge number of people who were on methadone, who were getting on with their lives, who were holding down jobs, and were coming in uh, on their way home from work into our clinics that were open at the night time. So people can stabilise on Absolutely. methadone, they can get on with their lives, they can do jobs, they can support their families. Uh, and I, I don't think... To view methadone as a bad thing is 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 not a is not a. Uh, I think I think you're mistaken. I, I wasn't. I, I said that has ma methadone yeah. maintenance has a place to play in harm reduction. Yeah. Absolutely does. But yeah. then the barriers that people face when they want to come off, when they decide at, at that stage in their life, and sometimes there might be only a small window of opportunity for that person to be able to say this is the right time for me to be able to come off that, and they find the barriers that's in place just unbelievable, hard to get over. The obstacles are in that place. And that's where the recovery uh, supports need to be in place for those people. And uh, we have identified funding this year through the, um, the budget uh, that will start to really look at recovery uh, in, in a sustained manner. Uh, and I think that if we are looking at recovery, we have to have peers involved. We have to have people with lived experience involved. And that's all a learning process for the services. And, and that's all going to be moved forward in terms of the Citizens' Assembly recommendations and in terms of any new strategy. So, um, yes, if people want to come off methadone, then those recovery supports need to be in place. Uh, but it's not necessarily always a bad thing to remain on methadone because that person has remained alive. They've got access to treatment. They've got access to care. OK. Thank you. Ward and now Senator Fitzpatrick. Yeah, and thank you all uh, this morning for your uh, contributions here and your opening statements. Um, Mr. Ryan, can I start with you from a, a Justice uh, Department perspective? And um, I, I suppose I, I would say, speaking from my community's perspective, um, over the last 20, 30 years, I think the, the consensus would be that there's just abject failure there, um, that the approach the state has taken has absolutely and utterly failed um, our communities. And uh, 
it fails the victims uh, of, of uh, drug addiction, but it fails their families, their wider communities, and the prevalence now of drug drug availability, its sale, its use, its abuse in all forms, in public spaces, in public housing, in public streets, on canals, on buses, on trains. There is no place left in the country, schools, playgrounds, um, where drugs are not available and are not being used in some form or other. Um, and that is a damning indictment of where we are as a state. It's, it's, it's totally and utterly unacceptable. And, and I accept what your, you know, the description and, and the initiatives that are being taken recently, and the um, the program, you know, with the two trial sites, and and, and I've looked at that in detail, and, and I, I think it is a um, very promising initiative, and the concept and, and the thinking behind it. Um, but like with two trial sites, is that really? anywhere near adequate and what is the proposal to um, increase the scale of that and when you talk about the community efficacy and building resources of the community to withstand criminal influence considering how normalized and how pervasive this antisocial criminal activity is really what resources are, are going to be required to build community capacity to take it on. Because I think the community generally, I, I think the community individually and collectively are taking a position, whether consciously or subconsciously, to defend themselves from it. They don't feel like they're being backed up. They don't feel like there's support there. And that's a really scary place for, the, for those individuals, for those families, for those communities to be in. So I'd like to hear um, what, what you can say, I suppose, to reassure those communities, those individuals and families, that the state appreciates the enormity of it and is scaling up to address it in a meaningful way. Uh, thank you. Um, in relation to um, the, the Greentown program, I suppose I'll start with that because it, you referenced the, the two trials guides and the, the adequacy or otherwise of, of having two. We do have to test the model. It is very innovative. UL developed it in conjunction with ourselves, not based on, on a specific program that had happened anywhere elsewhere. So it has been internationally recognised as really innovative. But for an innovative program, you do have to test it. So that's why we have been testing it in two locations. But the intention is, to, um, to be able to adapt it and use it in other locations as well. So um, there is learning being gathered. There has been learning gathered from, from the operation to date. We have ex extended it for, for the three years and, and the, the outcomes that we, we hope to achieve following the further three years is to identify where, it, where and how it can be adapted for more mainstream use. So the intention is to expand beyond the two trial sites um, to wherever it's needed. That type of really intensive program isn't needed everywhere. There are certain parts of the country where it's more necessary, where organised criminal gangs are, are more embedded, I suppose, and, and you reference your own area as, as, as one such area, and, and you know, we, we, there are a lot of programmes in that area um, already, but this is something that could be considered um, for those areas in the future. In relation to the, the community uh, efficacy pillar that I mentioned and the resources that will be required to build capacity, uh, again in partnership with, with the rep team and University of Limerick, uh, a local leadership programme has been developed um, and it has been drawn down by um, some of our community safety partnerships that we've piloted in three locations. So we piloted local community safety partnerships in, um, in Longford, Waterford and North Inner City Dublin. Um, with a view to a national rollout later this year, and the three partnerships have worked very effectively. Um, but one of the uh, one of the areas identified by the partnerships, and this I think Longford were the first ones to do this, to um, to, to try and support communities who want to um, want to equip themselves better 
to be able to deal with, with organised criminality in their areas is to, um, is to build up the leadership capacity for, for local residents, for local um, activists who are involved in community-based organisations, uh, to ensure they have the skills and the capability to be able to interact uh, effectively either through structures like uh, community safety partnerships or just generally within their communities. And the, the, what we've heard back from Longford is that it has been really beneficial to those involved in it. And I know the, the Dublin, North Inner City Dublin uh, Local Community Safety Partnership are also exploring whether they can utilise that local leadership programme as well. So funding has been made available to, to Longford to do that and, and equally should should the North Inner City um, Local Community Safety Partnership express an interest and, and make an application to, uh, to draw down the local leadership programme um, that's, that's been piloted by the University of Limerick, um, we'd certainly be interested in that if, if they want to make an application for it. So there are, there are programmes there to try and assist the community, um, communities that are, that are in these kind of situations. We also work um, very closely with the HSC in relation to the drug-related intimidation and violence program as well to try and combat the, the drug-related, the drug debt intimidation and, and the related actions that go with that. And Garda Siakana are, are, are central to the actions in relation to that. And I know in, in, in North Inner City Dublin, that's an area where the DRIVE program um, is working well. There has been a, a coordinator uh, embedded there. And um, it's, it's obviously a really challenging thing to try and combat because people find it difficult to come forward given the level of pressure and intimidation that's placed on them. But uh, there are drug-related intimidation and violence inspectors uh, in, in every area in Langarda in Shikana around the country as well. And um, they're trying to embed themselves into communities so the communities can approach them. People within communities can approach them confidential, confidentially and with confidence um, to try and, and, and tackle the issue of drug-related intimidation. Um, I think uh, I've covered the specific points there, but I'm happy to come back in more detail if, 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 if needed. I can come back in. Um, I'm going to move on to Deputy Gould. I'm all good. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, the European Drug Report 2024 shows that Ireland has four times the drug death rate of the, average, of the European average and the highest per capita frequency of drug deaths. This is a shocking figure and it shows, in my opinion, the complete failure of the government's strategy uh, in relation to its drug strategy and how it... Um, to reduce, how it's working to reduce harm because like, these figures, to me, outline how serious a problem we have in this state at this moment in time. Um, so I, I suppose I'll get to some of the questions I want to have first. Um, all right, could you, could you please update me on nurse prescribing of opioid substitutes? I know the numbers on it, but I also know that I've supported people who have struggled either because their GP isn't on the scheme or because they don't want their family doctor to know. Is it the department felt? Or maybe uh, the HSE? I, well, I, I just want to acknowledge, you know, and agree, uh, Deputy, in terms of the, uh, the tragedy of drug deaths. I mean, everybody here is in agreement that, you know, any death is, is one death too many. So, so a lot of the focus in our strategy and the work of all our organisations is around harm reduction and, and really addressing and understanding the factors that, that relate to and um, underline those drug, drug deaths is really important and informs us in an evidence-based way around the kind of measures we need to put in place and access to, um, obviously, the, the range of supports, including medication, is important. Eamon, I talk to the, to the nurse prescribing. Sure. Um, and just to reiterate, obviously, the, every drug-related death is a tragedy. Uh, and uh, I suppose just one thing to caveat in relation to the European Drug Report is that not all countries record deaths in the same manner. So some other countries use uh, general mortality register deaths. Uh, so it, it's not, you're not comparing like with like when you look across European countries. Um, where we get a very robust... But it would it be safe to say that we still have, are extraordinarily high? Yes, we have a high yeah. drug related death. Yeah. But I would put it to you that other countries also have high drug related death rates. 
um, if they use similar methods. So we really do need to have, if you're going to compare European countries, you need to have a systematic approach to uh, recording deaths right across all European countries. And that would give you a better picture of where Ireland sits. But obviously, our death rate is high. And that's why uh, we're looking at issues such as the supervised injecting facility, uh, the rollout of naloxone, and increasing access to treatment. That's a real priority for the HSE. So I absolutely acknowledge that. But I just say that in the European context, if we want to compare countries, we have to be using the same methodology. You asked a specific question around nurse prescribing of OAT. Yes. Um, I'm not so sure that that is necessarily going to be a big uh, uh, answer to the problems. We don't have huge waiting lists at the minute uh, for OAT. And I think uh, the nurses play an extremely important role throughout addiction services in this country. And if you talk to anybody who's accessed treatment, they will always uh, identify the support that the nurse has given them. Uh, we're working through the Director of Nursing and Addiction Services and with the uh, Chief Nursing Officer in the Department of Health to enhance the role of nurses within our service. Uh, and that's a stepwise progression. So that's looking at having a a career pathway for nurses within uh, this, the service uh, to clinical nurse specialists, to nurse managers, uh, up to advanced nurse practitioners who would be the people who could uh, prescribe uh, drugs. Uh, and also to look at other drugs that nurses can prescribe within the service. So things like benzodiazepines, things like uh, alcohol detoxification, before we need to get any legislation change around uh, opiate substitution treatment. So that might be down the line, uh, but How it's, not a it's not a priority at the minute. Well, our priority is to get people into treatment, to enhance the nursing role, and to get nurses prescribing all these other medications that they can actually prescribe. And when will that happen? Uh, that's an ongoing process to get nurses prescribing, and we would be completely supportive of it. Okay, and have we figures, targets that we you want to reach in relation to nurse prescribing nurses? We need to get nurses trained up as advanced nurse practitioners before they can. Well, have start. you a target? No, I haven't got a target. And why not? Because uh, that's currently being worked on between the director of nursing and the chief nursing officer in the Department of Health to look at enhancing the role. So, are we looking that they'll make a decision in three months or six months of how many what targets they need to achieve and lay out a plan? Well, we can ask them to look at uh, specific targets. OK, uh, thank you. Um, the National Oversight Committee has been charged with overseeing the implementation of the, impl implementation of the drug strategy. I understand there are no SIGs for each of the six strategic priorities which was laid out, outlined in the opening statement. Where are the minutes for these meetings published? So... We have, they're on the gov government website. We have a quarterly update on the, um, the achievement against those targets. So as we said, there are six um, interest groups or implementation groups with a number of actions for each of those groups. And when the National Oversight Committee meets on a quarterly basis under the chairpersonship of um, the minister, the update is... No, no, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I've read the... Yeah. The, the opening statements, but are the minutes of each of those meetings published? We'll have to advise on that. I, I'm just aware okay. that we do. We, up, we provide an update on all the delivery of I, the I, actions, no, I, I yeah. don't doubt that. I'm just yeah. looking for the minutes of those meetings because they should be they should be available to the public. I'll come back uh, to you, deputy. Then. Thank, thank you very much. much. Also, in relation to methadone, it was discussed earlier. Uh, maybe the Department of Health or the HSE. There are pe people died who have been given methadone because they had heart conditions. Um, and when there seems to be a disconnect between the doctor who prescribes methadone and the family doctor. I tragically know of a case myself, personally, where you had a young man, 21 years of age, who had been with a family doctor all his life, uh, who had a heart condition, who had actually joined the army and had to come out of the army because he had an issue with his heart, so on medical grounds had to leave. <coughs> uh, he was prescribed methadone and died after his first uh, prescription of methadone, which was the minimum level of methadone given. Now, when that doctor who prescribed the methadone rang his GP, he, never, he asked what substances he was on, but he never asked the question, is this person suitable for methadone? Now, why isn't that question being answered? Because uh, according to uh, studies in America, 
people who take methadone who have heart conditions, people who have heart conditions should not be taking methadone. And why is it not being looked into? And is there a stigma around people who are in the throes of addiction that, um, like sometimes I think, like these people, a lot of them would have had families, would have had GPs, there would be knowledge there. It's not every person um, who's put on methadone uh, would have no uh, history or support behind them. And like, uh, that family were devastated. That person died and shouldn't have died. And the question I'm asked, uh, at the coroner's court, that was a recommendation a number of years ago, I think eight years ago. Has that been implemented? And if not, will it be implemented now? I might, as, as that's a clinical question, I'm going to pass that over to Professor Keenan. Thank okay. you. Well, I can't speak about this specific case, uh, but I will say that the decision to prescribe methadone or any other opiate agonist treatment isn't taken lightly by any doctor. So there would be a full comprehensive clinical assessment carried out of any patient who gets a prescription of methadone. There is one condition uh, that can be associated with high dose uh, methadone, uh, and that when people are on higher doses of methadone, uh, it's within our guidelines now that they all receive uh, ECGs uh, to check on the cardiac status. So the cardiac status of any person who commenced on methadone is uh, rigorously in interrogated by any doctor who should be prescribing it uh, at this point. So that's, it. that's well, a given. You made a point there that's only high prescriptions of methadone. I'll finish on this. This person was on the lowest level of methadone that could be described and died after one. Uh, prescription. So what I'm saying to you now is that procedure isn't fit for purpose. I will ask you to look at it again. And when doctors, the doctor at the time cited GDPR. So when a, a doctor prescribing methadone can ring the, the person's doctor and ask what, what they're on, all they have to do is ask one more question. Is this patient uh, suitable for methadone or is this patient had heart issues in the past? Yeah, and that's part... Sorry, we, we might come back to it again in the, okay. in the next round. We'll just get all of the speakers in on the fourth round, if that's OK, okay. Deputy Gould. Um, Senator O'Hara. Thank, you, Chair. Thank you very much for the opening statements um, and for the questions from other members uh, so far. I want to pick up on something first from uh, Deputy Gold here um, in relation to the challenge around data, um, systemically, that collation across Europe. How many are we comparable with? And where does that rank us? Um, yeah. So I haven't got the number of the countries uh, okay. that we would be comparable with, but I would say that the HRB uh, are very effective at uh, getting robust data so that any suspicious death they link in with the coroners on a, on a regular basis. So uh, if you look at general mortality rates, it's much lower for this country. Uh, and. We, we would be in a different scenario, uh, but I think that it's important that the HRB do the work that they do in relation to collating that information, because that does give us a true picture of the harms uh, that drugs can cause. I suppose we do see uh, polysubstance abuse as being uh, a significant driver of drug-related deaths. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions on this, and particularly for health and HSE. So, um, Comparative spend to other European countries, so we got some figures in your opening statement. How does that benchmark against others? Um, and then particularly when you talked about some of the, the key actions that you're taking, are there inhibitors to good practice by the Misuse of Drugs Act? And if you can explicitly say what they are. So I might take the, the question. Uh, I might just also add to um, Eamon's commentary, just on, on Ireland's drug debts and our comparator with other European countries, the type of drug also has an impact. So, so we look at, you know, whilst we don't have the same uh, systems for measuring and collating um, deaths, we do look at the causes of deaths. And, and that also informs us then in terms of investing the types of treatments or investment that, that will make a difference. And, uh, certainly what we've been doing in turn so our budget as you, you say is um, approximately 160 million um, with additional funding provided over the last two years and that has been given to provide a range of interventions both an increase in the number of uh, drug support services the addiction services
services on the ground and supports for communities in addition to things like the, the new um, services for naloxone, the training regime for naloxone, the provision of greater supplies of naloxone to meet the reasons why we're seeing some of those harms happening in the community. So, so our, in, in terms of how we're comparing to other European countries, I would have to come back to you on that. Thanks. Um, and then explicitly the barriers um, for good practice internationally caused by the Misuse of Drugs Act. Uh, maybe that's justice. Sorry, in, are you referring to something specifically? Um, I mean, in, in terms of innovative, we're talking about health-led approaches, we're talking about human rights compliant approaches. Um, and I, you know, I, I very firmly believe that the Misuse of Drugs Act inhibits us from some of those. And um, what sort of evidence do we have internationally that suggests um, that, that we can't do because of the Misuse of Drugs Act? Um, well, I suppose that if you look at the various harm reduction initiatives that would be utilised, so naloxone uh, provision that we uh, very much uh, have embraced that and are rolling that out as we saw last year we had uh, we delivered over 6,000 samples of or doses of naloxone and it was used over 400 times um, so that yes we, we, we provide that in terms of supervised injecting facility uh, which is one of the significant harm reduction elements uh, we've been through a process uh, to get that uh, up and running and that's been a, a long and torturous process uh, but uh, we're nearly there. Building has commenced uh, on the supervised injecting facility, uh, and that's expected to be open by the end of the year. So we're addressing as many of the issues uh, in relation to the significant harm reduction uh, initiatives uh, as we are. And it must be said that we got full support from the Department of Justice and the Department uh, of Health in relation to the establishment of all those uh, initiatives. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the initiative that we're looking at developing with Angarda Shikana, uh, where we would be doing a pilot for Angarda Chikana to be trained uh, in the identification of overdose and the carrying of naloxone to be able to administer it on the street. So I think there's a very clear uh, uh, approach by uh, the departments to support the health-led approach. Um, one of the other areas that we couldn't have done without the support of Angarda Chikana uh, and within the confines of the, of the um, Misuse the Drugs Act is the back of house drug testing that we're doing at festivals. You know, the guards uh, will support that initiative because they see it as um, uh, improving the safety of people attending festivals. Thank you. Um, and then I'm specifically thinking about data collation in terms of service use um, and access to services. Um, uh, and what sort of data are we systemically collecting? And do we have any sort of picture of vulnerable groups that are maybe falling through that net? Okay, so anybody who commences treatment uh, in uh, our service would be complete national drug, re drug treatment reporting service that re feeds into the HRB. So we collect information in relation to the type of uh, substance they use, their family background, uh, their ethnicity. So with the ethnicity, we can identify um, marginalised groups or uh, cohorts like that. Uh, we also collect information then through the central treatment list for people on methadone. So it's very much uh, part of our uh, consciousness that uh, marginalised groups need to be prioritised into treatment and we're putting in place uh, effective mechanisms to be able to record that. And I suppose it's important to note then that addiction actually sits within social inclusion in uh, the HSE uh, who do look after the vulnerable groups. So uh, we have regular contact with uh, all of our uh, people who are looking after migrant health, people who are looking after traveller health, uh, people who are looking after LGBTI, uh, domestic violence. So we all work together uh, and as much as possible addiction takes into account all of those parameters. Okay. Um, I might add, just, just in, in addition, the National Oversight Committee monitors that sort of information in addition to bespoke research for particular migrant groups or, or vulnerable groups. And in the last year, we've had a, a very significant piece of research in relation to the impact of drugs use on women and um, access to services. And, and I suppose what that has helped us do is then invest through the Women's Health Action Fund to put in additional funding to address and ensure that women who are struggling with problematic drug use are able to access, and, and oftentimes with their families, um, to access services that are more designed to meet their needs. 
Thank you. Um, I, in terms of justice, I'm, I, if I can ask specifically then about some challenges around uh, cross-border, um, particularly around supply. Um, uh, I'm a northerner. Um, and, and potential challenges um, as we change our approach here or evolve our approach um, on a lack of evolution in the north. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, the first thing to say, I suppose, is the, the relationship and the cooperation between Ungarda Siakana and the PSNI is, is really excellent. Um, both, both police services regularly cite the level of cooperation they get um, in relation to all forms of crime, really, but, but obviously tackling organised criminal gangs who, who operate close to or around the border um, is a particular focus of the, of the cooperation that goes on between the two services. So, Despite the fact that there's different laws in place in both jurisdictions, um, the relationships and the operational cooperation is the key thing, the sharing of intelligence, um, and that goes on on a daily basis. We've heard it said, and I've heard from, from colleagues in the Department of Justice Northern Ireland, that there are certain PSNI members stationed near the border who have said they, they ring their equivalent in Dundalk or Monaghan more often than they'd ring their equivalent in, in Lisbon or whatever. So that's, that's the level of cooperation that, that's there. Um, so we want to maintain that and continue to build on it. But the, the second point you made, Senator, is relevant. I mean, if, if, um, if our approaches diverge further, it will present the police and challenge. There's no doubt about that. Um, at the moment, both jurisdictions have similar enough, um, similar enough legislation around misuse of drugs. If there is a, a big divergence, it's something that the police services will have to take into account and, and, and adopt practices accordingly. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to move on now to Senator Siri Carney, who has swapped spaces with Joseph Madigan. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for facilitating me. Uh, I, I, I am late to this, so I may ask questions that have already been asked, uh, so apologies. Um, I, I want to begin my... I, I was at a briefing last year uh, that was uh, launched by um, Minister Hildegard Nocton, and at it we saw... Uh, statistics given to us uh, from the research, which was really a, a fantastic, fantastic level of, of um, data. However, it showed that while drug use is across all sectors of society, its effect and its impact, its devastating impact, is more particularly felt in disadvantaged communities. And so I look, I, I have the privilege of working with a drugs task force and seeing a drugs and alcohol task force and seeing firsthand the incredible work done by a very small group of people on the ground in delivering that recovery, in delivering those interventions, those supports, both to families on family programs, um, outreach workers. Uh, and it is just, I am always in awe of, of what I hear on, at the monthly meetings of the sheer work and, and incredible dedication of people. But in these more, the more disadvantaged the community, um, the more under pressure they are. They are suffering in the main from poverty, uh, you know, from uh, children need extra interventions. They're the ones that are most deprived of assessment of needs. And um, they're the ones that are most likely uh, that are, are find accessibility to the support of their children um, is the, the absolute steep uphill. In fact, it's a, it's a cliff. They're climbing up a cliff. And so I suppose when I read your opening statements and I look at all of this, I think, where's the interdepartmental group? Where's the Department of Children in all of this uh, in resourcing youth workers? Where is that coordinated approach? Because when I see the recommendations, I see certainly policy. We, we need sharpening up and innovation on policy uh, and on, on delivery. And I'll come back in a minute to the sheer funding of the, of the drugs task forces and how that's done. Um, but, but this coordinated approach that needs an all of government. So where, are the, where is DSP? Where is the Department of Children? Where is this interdepartmental group that coordinates that everybody needs to be fully resourced because we need to tackle particularly in disadvantaged communities. We have women who um, may be on a maintenance programme and doing very well, but then they're targeted in their community. And I heard a report recently from um, the, a specific crack cocaine um, outreach programme that's going on, and that, that women can go from having their lovely home and within three weeks, everything gone. 
and their children devastated. And, and it is that urgent. It is harrowing to listen to it. So the idea that we would sit here and we would talk about pilots and we would talk about something in the future while people are suffering and dying in the here and now, I find appalling, to be perfectly honest. Um, the funding of drugs task forces seems to me to be the absolute unbelievable Cinderella of the entire Department of Health. They, uh, they don't have a voice at the table, as far as I can see. They went for an awful long time without getting any increase in their funding at all. There is a, a um, almost a, a suspicion, they're an inconvenience in, in how, in, and I'm not saying that about the task force that I'm involved in, they don't feel that at all, but, but from going to meetings, sitting with the chairs network, they, they're totally without, voiceless when they actually should, given how urgent their work is, they should be really properly resourced. And the idea of giving them a program funding that lasts for a year or nine months or is for a specific piece of work, when that actually needs to be a multi-annual piece of work, is, shows a complete disconnect to the experience on the ground versus what is, what is needed to, in, in some ivory tower of funding that, where decisions are made. It's complete, a complete disconnect. Um, I should stop speaking and, and leave it to you to say something. Um, but I, I, I want to know where we are at changing what is a culture, a cultural attitude. A person with a drug addiction is a mother, is a daughter, was once a child brought home from a hospital and celebrated and dressed up beautifully. And the idea that they reach a point in their lives where they're treated as cont in contempt in society and brandished as a drug addict or whatever, is, I find appalling and heartbreaking uh, for these communities. We, we need to have an urgent upsurge in, in getting on with it and not just talking about it. Anyway, I'll stop there. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. Thank so. Thank you, uh, Deputy. Um, I, I'll take that question. So, so I agree. Um, and I think compassion is at the heart of our national drug strategy. It's compassion. It's not punishment. And it's, it's to reduce the stigma and to ensure that people live those fulfilled lives that they deserve and are entitled to. Um, one of the big strategic priorities in the national drug strategy and in our strategic action plan is to address the social determinants of health and those communities that are experiencing the consequences of drug use. So that's about supporting exactly that, the drugs and alcohol task forces, community-based services, and as I would have said in my opening statement, one third of the funding that goes to our drug services nationally is directed towards our community services. Many of those are through the 24 um, drugs and alcohol task forces and they support approximately 280 separate initiatives. But in addition to that, via the HSE, those organisations are also in receipt of funding. And you did point to something that has changed in the last number of years, and it's that move towards providing recurring funding. So we have seen and we have heard that issue in relation to one-off funding or pilots then leaves people with a lack of certainty hard to recruit people to continue to work in those sort of services, but there has been an increase in the recurring funding or the proportion of funding that is now given on a recurring basis. And that gives communities greater certainty, it gives the people who work in those services greater certainty, and it creates a better connection between those who work in the services and those who receive those services, so they build up that trust in each other. In terms of your other question around cross-governmental and what are we doing in that, well, under the National um, the, the national Oversight Committee for the National Drug Strategy has a cross-governmental lens. So we have colleagues from the Department of Education, from the Department of Justice and other government departments involved, but they're specifically involved in actions relating to the drugs you know, management of drug services, looking at prevention, the Department of Education, working with our colleagues in justice in terms of harm reduction measures and reducing, uh, addressing those coercive pieces. But also, as, as uh, my colleague Ben would have said, there is a requirement and a recognition that communities themselves, independent of the drugs element, do need to be supported. And we have the local area boards. The local area boards are these uh, cross-governmental board under the governance of um, the Department of the Taoiseach and the Cabinet Committee on Social Affairs and Public Services, which holds that lens and, and they work on the community safety partnerships is forming part of the learning about how we can learn about how 
government at a local level, all of those organisations that are funded in providing supports, whether they're sports partnerships, whether they're health services, whether they're on Garda Siakana, working together with local communities to address the kind of issues and make these communities strong and vibrant in places where people are proud to live in, and also addressing any of the issues that arise that make these areas more disadvantaged. Uh, I might just come in as well, just from an HC perspective. We do fund uh, community and voluntary sector, and a lot of our services are delivered through that sector. And I agree with you, it's critically important uh, because they're very close and part of the communities they serve. Um, the drug task forces are also uh, really important uh, in terms of mobilising that, that support for the strategy. Uh, so I completely agree with you. There is a particular project uh, that Professor Keenan might want to, to talk about in terms of the crack cocaine issue you mentioned, because mm. of course it is it is devastating. It's horrific. Um, mm. uh, and uh, you know, just to acknowledge uh, um, uh, Siobhan's point on the multi-annual and sustained funding, that is really important because mm. we're nurturing these programs along and want them to strengthen, and that means they need to be sustained. Uh, and that effort needs to be sustained. Our community connector projects as well, in terms of the health and wellbeing division, uh, is working very closely with local authorities and playing an important role <coughs> in, in that community connection and building that community and voluntary sector. Uh, Professor Keenan, do you want to say something about the women's programme? And, uh... So we do run some uh, crack cocaine uh, specific women's programmes in Tala that looks to address those very issues that you spoke about because there was a recognition uh, that a lot of women were running into difficulties in relation to crack cocaine and they need support. So we've introduced, uh, through funding provided by the department, uh, initiatives in Tala and South Inner City uh, which will specifically look at crack cocaine and support uh, people. Uh, around that horrendous drug. And I suppose it's important to note that year on year we have been increasing the number of people who have been able to access treatment for cocaine. We're expecting treatment figures to be released again next week uh, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the impact of any funding that we've received for, for cocaine over the, la uh, the last two years might be reflected in uh, treatment figures for next week. Thank you. Your point, your point on the officer officers are really important. Very briefly, Mr. Ryan, and then I'll have to move on. Yes, sorry, thank you, Jeff. I'm sorry, Professor Ryan made um, on the the coordination of approaches, you know, at local level, and, and Siobhan mentioned the, the, what's going on in Taoiseach to try and pull together all the various different strands with community safety partnerships. SIPSIs are already there for the Department of Children, Sloan to Care, the communities. There's, there's a whole range of them, and what Taoiseachs are doing are trying to pull them all together. And, and target areas of particular disadvantage where a lot of money has gone in, but we haven't yet seen the, the type of change yet that we want to see. And I know uh, Senator Siri Kang is very familiar with the Cherry Orchard Implementation Board and was, was instrumental in the work leading up to that. That's one of the examples of the 12 areas that we're looking at to try and identify areas where we need to have a more targeted approach. So that's the kind of model that you're familiar with that, that, we're, that we're trying to upgrade. I appreciate that we can't measure what we've prevented. We, you know, that that is a challenge, that you we can do a lot of work and we don't know what we have prevented from happening. So I do appreciate that, and I also appreciate the fantastic people in the Gardaí, and particularly in the HSC that work, particularly in the Dublin 12. They're amazing people. <coughs> to move on to Deputy McAuliffe, and then I'll go back to um, Deputy uh, Horrigan after that. Thank you. Um, just listening to some of the different contributions, like we could spend several hearings here going through the flaws in the system, the challenges that we think exist. Um, but like the establishment of this committee, I think is a, essentially a once in a generational opportunity for us to really get in a very dedicated way, get to grips with how we can make this better. Um, so the second thing, also while I accept there are huge amounts of, of flaws in the system, I'm going to accept that you know that too. Um, and that we can try and address, the, uh, address how we can improve that in this process. The second thing is, is I want to address that I, I accept your bona fides in coming here and that you want to make it better too. I think the big societal challenge we have here is, is that people aren't necessarily in full agreement about how we make this better. Um, and there's lots of people that want to make change because they know the current system isn't working, but they're also terrified of making things worse. Um, and I think yeah, a lot of people are coming to that to this discussion with with, with 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 that approach. And I think the Citizens Assembly came with that approach. So I want to talk just about the Citizens Assembly because, in essence, that's the that's the report that's laid before us. That's what we're given reasons taught taught to, and it's particularly to Mr. Ryan. I suppose with the National Drug Strategy and with the recommendations of the, of the Citizens Assembly, um, 
where do we, where do we, where does the department now stand in terms of development of policy, and what, what do you see as the way forward for us making recommendations, government adopting them, and so on? What's the pathway as opposed to the, the position? Yeah, um, thanks, Deputy. Um, well, we're working obviously very closely with colleagues in the Department of Health on, on the pathway forward. You know, the, they have the policy lead in relation to drugs, but we, we work very closely with them. So, like at the moment, what we've what we've been progressing is the health diversion program, uh, health diversion scheme. I'm um, sorry, it's changed title recently, so I haven't, haven't caught up with that. Um, yeah, so on the health diversion scheme, it's to try and afford additional opportunities for people who are caught in possession of drugs to avoid going into the criminal justice system. We already have the adult caution scheme for... for they, they often referred to as the two strikes system, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we have that. We're, we're, we're introducing another, another layer, really, and another opportunity for people to, uh, to engage with health services rather than end up in the criminal justice route. We know that, um, you know, that people going to prison for short sentences is not rehabilitative, it doesn't do them any good, so anything we can do to keep people out of prison for minor offences, okay. that's where our focus is. And I suppose that's the last time the Iraqis took a position on this, so that's where you are taking your lead in terms of the health diversity system. Clearly the, the Citizens' Assembly would appear to go further than that, and, and Mr Reid was here and he made it clear what the Citizens' Assembly is, but it's, it's an advisory body, it's not, it's not the law, so I accept you can't take your lead from that. But do you accept that there's a sort of hiatus here now between when we make recommendations here, and I'm not assuming what, what recommendations we'll make, and the strategy that you are currently implementing. And I just wonder, um, are you building in any future changes? Are you building in the type of initiatives that the Citizens' Assembly looked at into the current strategy, or are you, in essence, in, in a holding power, you're, you're stuck at the 2017 point until we make a different decision? Is that essentially where we're at? Um, no, we are conscious of what the Citizens' Assembly recommended. As you say, it, it's not yet government policy, so, um, but we are, I mean, I think what the Health Diversion Scheme does is it, it goes in the exact same direction as the Citizens' Assembly recommendation. It doesn't go as far, except that. But what, what um, Siobhan has mentioned as well previously is that we're going to evaluate it after 12 months. So as this committee deliberates, produces its, its report and recommendations, they're considered by government. In the meantime, we'll have been working on this scheme, we'll have been evaluating this scheme, we'll know uh, its impact, and if it's working well, there will be the potential there, there'll be evidence there that we can build upon okay. to say, let's expand it. Yeah, in terms of, I suppose, us developing, because essentially a lot of this will lie with justice in terms of the, 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 the criminal nature uh, and the way we have criminalised addiction and so on, I suppose, how can the department assist us? So, for example, if we believe, and I think this is one of the challenges, is trying to operationalise the Citizens' Assembly's recommendations, if that's what we decide. How can the department assist us in terms of, uh, uh, maybe it's as, uh, as micro as assisting in draft, draft wording or particular proposals around the Misuse of Drugs Act and so on? I suppose what I would like is, is that we would work with the department during this process rather than us presenting bullet points that then sit in the minister's office that have to be, have, have to be uh, developed. So the question is, what, what way can we work together on whatever strategy we decide to ensure that the legal proposals we make are robust and actually stand up? Well, we'd be very happy to engage further with the committee at any point in, in your deliberations. So, obviously, we'd, we'd, we'd be involved in the Department of Health because it's, it's their legislation, yeah. and we would be um, obviously involved in the operational agencies as well, HSC and Garda Síochána, and if, if it can, impacts can on the DPP as well. Can you just talk to me about, about that, about the, the, the two departments? So, obviously, you say it's their legislation, but obviously the issues around um, criminal justice is online with your department. Is there, a, is there a challenge there we should be aware of between the two departments? No, no. Um, the, the, the way the two departments operate in relation to drugs policy is, is hand in glove, hand in hand, essentially. You know, the two of us work very, very closely on the national, the national strategy that's there. We, you know, we have you know, formal structures, but we also have a, a lot of informal engagement as well. So well, I might make a recommendation to the committee afterwards, but it might be something you consider. You know, I think as we go through this, perhaps a point person or a liaison person with, bo with both departments would be useful for the committee, um, maybe perhaps in private sessions where we could have additional uh, discussions uh, around drafting and, uh, and so on. Uh, I want to just, in the last minute that I have, um, I think... So, so so much of this does revolve around the legal and, and, and policy approaches, um, but a huge amount of it re re relies on what uh, Senator Siri Carey talked about is, you know, often um, the issues of, of addiction 
are around medication of trauma, you know, around poverty, about disadvantage, about all of those, those, those issues. They become concentrated in their, those areas. And then people who aren't involved in those issues end up experiencing um, the, the negative impacts of, of all of that, as well as those people who are in addiction. I, both you and I have worked very hard on, on the, uh, Im, uh, the implementation board for Ballymun. Like, in essence, that was a political choice because we lobbied, we pushed hard, there were some 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 areas included and other areas not not included. Okay, and like look, that's I accept that, that that's our system, right? A cherry orchard was included for one reason. Other other areas were. We need to look at a data driven system. You know, let's take the top top one hundred most disadvantaged DDs in the whole country. Let's not leave it up to politicians to lobby good, bad, whatever. Let's just say when when something falls below a certain level of disadvantage. X happens, and there's a whole range of packages actually trigger in, and it includes the local authority, TUSLA, HSE, and so on. And there's almost like a, a crack team that goes in there for for a period of time until we can improve uh, improve outcomes for those areas. Because for 30 or 40 years, partnerships, implementation boards, uh, different t uh, task forces in the in the inner city, we've just far too fragmented a, a policy approach. And we're right. It's multi. It's multi department. So I, I say that as a suggestion, um, and I think it's something I will be pushing through the process because I've seen how hard it was to establish it for one area. And the last point. The last point I'd make: the community safety partnerships. I think are what we have. They're past. They're really important because we have to use them. But the two reasons that all of the previous interventions I have seen have failed, and I'm talking about area based partnerships, which are in many ways the same as what we're talking about now is because two agencies in particular have been absent from them, and that's the HSE and TUSLA. I, I, I have to call that out. An official comes, then a different official comes, then they stop coming altogether. And I'm talking over decades here, and you know, I'm not naming anybody. The HSE have to be involved in these area-based structures because you're spending millions of, and billions of money, um, and sometimes that voice isn't at the table. Joint police and committees are a good, are good, good, good example as well. So I say that as advisory as opposed to, as I say, the, the criticism. The, when the CSPs are up and running, the HSE and TUSLA cannot drift away from, from them. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Deputy. Thanks, Chair. Um, I might start with the Department of Health, maybe. These are relatively quick for um, questions. Uh, one of the recommendations from the Citizens Assembly was around stakeholder engagement um, with the work that you do. And I'm just wondering, could you outline what engagement you envisage and what engagement you, you currently um, undertake? So stakeholder engagement is a very key part of the work that we do. Um, in terms of the strategy itself, well, I suppose what I'm asking for, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear, is yeah. who are the stakeholders that you're engaging with? So on the National Oversight Committee, we have representation from uh, civil society. Who is that? Um, just have to get the page here now. Uh, colleagues there. Just, um, so we have, yeah, from civil society, we have four me uh, members, including Citywide, Cool Mine, Ishka and a new member will be is, is being onboarded shortly from the family support sector. So that represents a range of. Um, uh, Th those sorry, all those groups would, would it be accurate to say all those groups are in the realm of addiction services or supports for families? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any representation in the conversation on the board in any of those rooms from student bodies, for example, from uh, nightlife groups? from anything like that? So, so on the Oversight Committee, it, they, so as, as described in my opening statement, we have the Oversight Committee is, is a broad range of, of um, members, but then there are six separate strategic actions, and within those pillars, there are stakeholders involved in each of those. Okay, so are any of those the, stakeholders student groups, in the you know, drug advocacy groups? Ishka um, is one of the main uh, NGOs that, that are involved in, in representing uh, service users, but in our prevention piece... So I, I hate to cross yeah. you, service users implies people who are using addiction services. I'm asking, are there any groups who would represent a cohort that commonly would be using drugs in Ireland, such, not to impugn any students, but such as student groups? So uh, the HSE engage uh, on an ongoing basis with uh, the Union of Students of Ireland. How do they do that? Uh, they sit with us on our Safer Nightlife programme. Uh, they were at the launch uh, of our 
um, programme two weeks ago. They, they were, were invited to a lunch? They were sitting on the panel at okay. the front of the uh, audience answering questions about how uh, the Safer Nightlife programme would enhance safety for young people attending uh, nighttime economy events. Okay, and but in terms of policy development, are they in those rooms? So no, not at the moment. Not um, at the moment. No, okay. No, but it, um, it's a very good point, and it's something we want to enhance. Is that voice of service you Not so well. Much certainly, the citizens' use, assembly yeah, is is yeah. giving you a mandate to do that now. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, what work is the Department of Health currently doing on EU trends in um, drug regulation and in, in drug services? Um, like, what current research is being undertaken? So the department is very heavily involved in the European drug strategy and in terms of the European um, organisation. So we, I just have to, in terms of the... Are, are we doing, let's say, data analysis on uh, regions that have changed drug policy and are having either good or bad outcomes and are we going to parse that data and make it public? So part of the work that we'll be doing in 2024 is an evaluation of our current uh, national drug strategy taking on board the learning from our EU partners and ensure so it is that piece around looking at how we're doing against what we said we would do looking at how we're doing against the European using European data where so sorry that sorry. that's very useful not quite my question though okay. it, it's not my question was not about what our policy is and how it fares against EU trends or norms or changes. It was, is there a, an active piece of work in the department being done to keep tabs and, and data analyse what is happening across Europe in and of itself, not in relation to ourselves? So we're very heavily involved in the horizontal group um, on drugs, the working group on drugs, which is a European uh, group and we're also involved in the Pompidou group which is a cross European group and, and part of that our involvement in that is to be both a participant sharing information from the Irish context but also hearing the information from other countries and jurisdictions and taking that learning back to the Chair, I, I think this um, committee would be very interested in some of the outcomes of that and if, if the department was able to pass that on I, I'd be very grateful. Yeah. Um, if I might m move on to Oh, sorry, Just go ahead. We are involved in a number of ongoing EU projects. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we're collaborating. The HRB are key players in uh, the web survey uh, of drug use across Europe. Uh, Ireland uh, are a key member of the ESCAPE project, which is looking at syringe analysis uh, across eight uh, different European states. Uh, we're involved in the wastewater analysis, uh, the SCORE project uh, across uh, 20 European uh, countries, looking at uh, predictors and prevalence of, of drug use. So we very clearly see uh, the benefit of linking in with European colleagues in relation to ongoing research. And in fact, in the last uh, European drug survey, Ireland had the highest number of respondents uh, for uh, people who use drugs in uh, the nighttime economy uh, of any European country or oh. second sorry be behind Hungary okay, yeah, yeah, so that, that's a really key element of our work is that cross European research. Oh, that's fascinating thank you. Um, if I might move to the HSC then um, your safer nightlife program uh, the social, you know, the social inclusion aspect um, and, and how it was dealt with in the Citizens' Assembly, there was um, a suggestion that you need more funding and expansion. I'm just wondering, I don't have a huge amount of time left, but if you could um, put some bones on that. Is what exactly do you need for that to work better? Okay, well, we got some money. We got uh, money for a machine, uh, which we launched last yes. week. The minister launched that. Which so, I was delighted to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a GCMS machine, which is able to analyse particularly these new drugs. And that, the benefit of that was really shown last Friday when we got a tablet from uh, Limerick, uh, which had a synthetic uh, opioid in it, and we were able to analyse that and put an alert out on Friday night. So yeah. that was really uh, important. That was amazing, by the way. The, the uptake in synthetic opioids is really, really scary. Yeah, um, it is ahead. a big scary, and it's a big uh, part of our work is now to, to look at that. Uh, we do need uh, additional uh, resources in terms of expanding that emerging uh for us to be able to keep a close eye on what's emerging because it happens so quickly uh, that we need staff on the ground. So we have got uh, uh, proposals into the department uh, to expand um, 
uh, the emerging trends uh, analysing uh, work that we do and any support so we you, get would be delighted. you need more funds and more resources, I presume, more staff? Yes, more staff. I'll staff, ask it to you like this key, in a benign point. way. If we doubled your funding, would that be useful? It would be. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I know I'm over time, Chair, Go but ahead. I have just one, one quick question, to, or maybe two. Um, uh, you talked there about um, children being coerced into uh, drug trade, I suppose, more, more accurately than, than drug taking. Young children. What, what's the youngest you're aware of in that cohort of children who are being asked to do you know, lookout duties or whatever it might be? Um, that's kind of anecdotal evidence, but, you know, seven, eight, yeah. Eight-year-olds? Yeah. Being asked to look out? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I just very, very finally for yourself, um, on the issue of referrals or the health-led scheme, right, one, one person uh, who um, is a recovered addict actually said to me a, a couple of years ago, and it really stuck with me, that they were worried about any change in policy because they see the criminal system as the gateway to service provision, as in you get, you get your services, your health services, when you get a conviction. And that really shocked me. That really surprised me. Um, and while I very much welcome a health-led approach, uh, it does strike me that perhaps funneling people through a health-led scheme means that those people who are in active addiction, you know, might take up, might not get places for... So I'm, I guess my question to you is, when you are um, directing people towards a health-led scheme, which is a good thing, uh, is there a framework of discretion so that you can um, ensure that the, the few places that we have, and we know we're tight on funding and resources in, in the health-led sector, the few places that we have are taken up by people in active crisis or active addiction, and not by people who are attempting to escape a conviction. So the, the way the scheme, um, the draft scheme that's there at the moment is devised, it's, it's not a compulsory attendance. Uh, at, at the health intervention, so... Um, it's not compulsory for the person, but if the person doesn't want a conviction, there is a huge in, in, enticement for them to say, yes, I'll go to this health-led scheme. And then the person in active addiction who desperately needs that place might not get it. Well, do, you, um, do, you, do, you, do you take my point? I do take the yeah. point. Um, in relation to the, the programmes that they're going to have access to, I think um, Eamon or, or Martina yeah. might be able to talk about that sure. a bit better, but there's different programmes for different levels. Yeah. Obviously, for people in active addiction, it's very different from people who are more casually using drugs. So they'll be directed towards whatever the appropriate... Um, so I suppose, but for you, as, as representing the Department of Justice, there's no discretion for, for, from your side. I know there's discretion from the person's side, the individual side, but is there discretion from your side? Well, from the, the Gardaí have, have operational discretion in relation to individual cases and, and okay. how best to approach them. So that will be maintained under the scheme. And in many instances, guards do not prosecute people um, for, for possession of small amounts of drugs. I'm going I'm to have Sorry, to move on thanks, from way over. Um, uh, Deputy Shanahan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Good morning to the guests. Um, appreciate your attendance here. I just want to ask a few questions of the HSC, but just before I do, I wanted to put a comment on the record, which is further to our previous meeting where we were talking about the number of vulnerable people that were being uh, who were in addiction and were being criminalised for possession. So someone sent me a note uh, just to outline that young professionals are also uh, being charged with possession and are being criminalised and their names are appearing in papers, which is having significant um, effects to their professional career prospects, to their relationships. I just wanted to note that. Could I just talk to the HSC for a few minutes, please, just on a number of the initiatives that you've outlined there. One is uh, the naloxone, and you've stated that you've 977 people have completed the Module 1 training, 179 the Module 2. Can I ask you just very quickly, who are those people? Where are they based? And in terms of the pilot programme with Gardaí, why are we waiting for this? This is commonplace in other security services across the EU. So just quickly on that, if you please. Yeah. In because they're overseeing the, the training and also engaged with the in setting up that program with the Guardi correctly. So, Josephine, do you want to? Sure. Uh, so, uh, the, the people who are engaged are uh, service providers. Uh, they're coming, we're actively targeting uh, homeless service providers, uh, so people who are 
working in PAAs, working in hostels, uh, working on frontline services uh, are accessing that. We're also uh, having, a, uh, there's one thing that we are doing in relation to uh, naloxone is we're training peers uh, around uh, how to uh, identify an overdose and carry. So we're by, by at this stage now, we have 128 peers right across the country trained in the Circle programme. So these are the people who will come across overdoses and see people. And so that's really been a big initiative. It's called the Circle programme, 128 peers. So peers, frontline service providers, uh, and uh, people working uh, in hostels, uh, family members also uh, can be trained in uh, provision of naloxone. Because if somebody gets naloxone home yeah. uh, and they overdose, they're not going to necessarily give it to themselves, so their family members need to be trained. It's pr pretty reasonably, I understand, it's, it's not that difficult to administer. Can I ask you just, yeah. in terms of, of the guard, that why are we waiting to roll out a programme of this for guards? We, uh, as my understanding, I can't speak necessarily for the guards, but uh, I do know that we have had engagement with them. They are supportive of the idea of developing uh, these two pilots. They're looking at two Dublin metropolitan areas uh, whereby the guards will be trained. We're ready to give the training to Wingarda Shikona in relation to uh, that. And uh, I've met with the chief medical officer in, in Angarda Shikona and I've offered my support to the chief medical officer uh, on an ongoing basis. We've invited Angarda Shikona to join our quality assurance group, which oversees naloxone. So I'm hopeful uh, that we're going to be uh, able to provide naloxone and the guards will be carrying the nasal spray as opposed to the injectable. So there'll be no needles involved. Yeah, well, that'll be good. Uh, just in terms of then the um, medically supervised injection, injection facilities, and we're talking about Merchant Ski, and this has been spoken about for a number of years now, but can I ask you, uh, you've, you've stated you want to do a six months evaluation, then a final evaluation at 18 months. Again, these are being used across other countries. What are we going to evaluate in Ireland that hasn't been evaluated elsewhere? Okay, and why so are we waiting so long to, to get this project off the ground and to see about trying to do further ones around the country? We're waiting so long because we've been through a planning process involving uh, um, Board Planola and uh, a judicial review. We've got out at the end of that. We're now uh, implementing. And over the course of that five years, the cost of uh, construction had increased, so we had to get additional funding. Uh, in relation to the supervised injecting facility, we're very clear that evaluations across um, uh, Europe uh, uh, and North, North America have identified that there's been uh, a reduction in drug-related litter, there's been an increase in access to services, and there's been a reduction in overdoses. So we very clearly see these as having an evidence base. Uh, what we have to do now is we've been granted planning permission for 18 months from the opening of the facility. Uh, we've planned an evaluation at six months, so we can put that the results of that evaluation into the planning process to say uh, so that it can continue at the end of 18 months. We don't want to have 18 months and then it's a stop, but we're going to need something to persuade uh, Dublin City Council and the planning board to continue it. So that's why the evaluation at six months will feed into that. And we also have committed uh, with the Children's Ombudsman to do an evaluation of the uh, impact it would have on children in the local school. Thanks, Professor. Can I just go on then to your Safe uh, Nightlife programme? Yeah. And, and you're talking about having a presence at festivals, and I know the Department of Justice has been involved here in terms of the, of the Guard, and I think that's uh, helpful. But could I just ask, what are you doing on the ground in terms of trying to educate those kids that are coming into you, having taken pop pills at festivals and all that, trying to basically, hopefully, you know, uh, they, they get fixed up quickly or they may get sick and they get a bad experience, and that might be the best thing under supervision. Hopefully, they might put it off. But for the future, you know, trying to tell them, is, is there a danger that by having this, you know, apparent at festivals that we're kind of almost given credence to, uh, you know, kind of informal drug use at music festivals is something that's part of life. Yeah, uh, well, look, I suppose we're, this is a pragmatic approach, and uh, the reality is that people uh, at some of these events do use drugs, whether we like to admit to it or not. Uh, so, as well as the back of house testing at these festivals, we will have volunteers who are out and about uh, going around the campsites, going around, uh, talking to attendees. And I suppose that, in conjunction with us being able to uh, identify harmful substances and put out risk communications, is getting the message across. So, for the people who are attending these events, we were working with the festival promoters. Uh, they'll be giving information prior to attending the event around harm reduction, around the risks associated with drugs, so that everybody there will, uh, and the festival promoters and safety promoters have, built, have bought into this so that they'll be able to get access to that information. We'll have volunteers on site to be able to talk to them uh, about the harms and risks and if they're having any difficulties. And we have 
sort of pragmatic advice to them, like, you know, don't go away into a corner and use a loan. Uh, uh, you know, tell your friends what you're, if you do use drugs. Tell the medics uh, if you've taken drugs. So these are all the practical advice that we're doing in this, this programme, as well as the sort of headline thing where, they, where we're testing the drugs. So I, th I think it's a very positive initiative, by the way. I think it would it, be well supported. And just, I'm kind of running out of time here, but just the last thing on the, uh, and it was mentioned just a few minutes ago, the emergence of the synthetic opioids. And, um, you know, what trends are you seeing? And it was just been mentioned here earlier, you know, about the likes of, of uh, MDMA is here, crystal meth is on the way, fentanyl is definitely on the way. I know we haven't, we're saying we're not seeing it, but they're all coming. Um, just what trends are you seeing, firstly? Secondly, can I ask you, do you think that, would you have any awareness of these drugs actually being manufactured now in Ireland as opposed to being uh, imported in Ireland? And, uh, and in terms of the greater addiction that these drugs cause, you know, what further pressure is this putting on the system in terms of people actually being able to get off drugs or get maintenance, get recovery? Okay, there's a good bit there. Uh, so the synthetic opioids is a trend that uh, we're seeing uh, that's happening across Europe. And I suppose from a geopolitical point of view, you have to be aware that since the Taliban have banned the production of opium in Afghanistan, uh, there's been a 95% reduction in heroin, produ in heroin produ production from Afghanistan, and that's what feeds Europe. Uh, so uh, what's happening now is that the stocks of heroin are reducing, uh, and we're seeing increased number of synthetic opioids uh, being produced. These are being generally produced in the Far East, in China, and, and coming into Europe. I'm not aware of any production in um, Ireland of synthetic opioids. We are seeing, and our trends we're seeing across Europe are increasing potency uh, of drugs. Uh, so the MDMA tablets are getting stronger. Cocaine potency is increasing. But I suppose our big worry at the minute are the synthetic opioids, because uh, we've had now four incidents uh, that you were aware of uh, where synthetic opioids have been a problem. We had the overdose cluster in Dublin in November, in Cork in um, December. We had a small cluster of overdoses associated with nitocines in prisons in March. And this weekend, and it's sort of I'm dealing with it now at the minute, we are having uh, yellow tablets which were being sold as uh, counterfeit benzodiazepines, and we've identified that they've contained uh, nitazine drugs. So we've had a number of cases where we're, we're looking at the analysis around that. We've had a number of overdoses, and that's not just in one area. That's around the country. So that's a big worry and a big concern in terms of a trend at the minute. Thank you. Yeah, I'm out of time there, Chair. Thank you, Deputy Shanahan. Um, I'm going to go to Deputy Kenny. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. everybody, for their open statements. I just... Uh, if I could get a, a quick answer to the first question, I think this is very important. Do you accept uh, that the last six decades of Ireland's drug policy has essentially criminalised those that have used drugs? Yes or no? So, I, I suppose I can only speak to the current strategy and, and like it is very much based on, on strong evidence about the value of a health-led approach. So. So our policy since 2017 but, is very much in that space. And I suppose any of our policies across the broader health landscape are always built on what's learned from... But you know, essentially the policies since the Misuse of Drugs Act has criminalised people for using drugs. Essentially that's the policy of the state. That, that, that is the policy. So our health policy, though, is to support with compassion and ensure... That, that, that is the policy. You accept that that is the policy. I don't accept that that's the part that I don't accept that um, I, I accept that the I, I suppose I can't speak for the last six decades deputy but I can but say that right at the moment we are very much focused on a health led approach okay. and on investing very considerably and expanding the range of services. But the last six decades has criminalised people okay. for using drugs, the fact, and that's been an absolute failure, right? So um, I just want to get that kind of off my chest. Uh, just to clarify, Deputy Kenny, you mean do you mean the Drugs Act rather than policy, government yeah, policy yeah, itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since since uh, 1977. Thank you. So, and I do accept, and I do acknowledge that you know, in 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 the last number of years, there has been a a policy sh a policy shift in the HSC and the Department of Health in terms of this issue, right? And I think there's been a public shift, which is far, more important. That you know, criminalising people or marginalising people for drug use has been an abject failure, right? And I do accept, you know, as I said, this health led approach, harm reduction. But my kind of um, criticism of that, it's largely lip service. 
Because if we don't talk about the kind of the elephant in the room, we could be, we could be in this position in the next number of decades in terms of white people take drugs and, you know, the kind of uh, trying to police our way out of it. Because trying to police our way out of uh, the proliferation of drugs is impossible, absolutely impossible. So in them, in them terms, you've got to look at different approaches. And that's what this committee has been trying to do in terms of looking at different approaches. My approach, uh, I would argue, is that you've got to look at the Misuse of Drugs Act, you've got to look at kind of forms of regulation, uh, you've got to for, uh, look at forms of legalisation and dr d drug decriminalisation of, of the person. So um, with all that, um, Probably a good example of what kind of lip service kind of accumulates to is the adult caution scheme around cannabis. Just correct me if I'm wrong, this was introduced in late 2021. Uh, cannabis was uh, a part of the adult caution scheme. That's correct, is it? Um, I think it was 2020 or... Yeah. yeah, it was around that time. How, ma how many people have been issued with a kind of an adult caution in terms of that scheme? For the last three years, it's been in and around the 1600 mark, just, just over or under in different years. Yeah. And how many people have been prosecuted in terms of simple possession of cannabis? Um, I don't have disaggregated figures on that because generally when people are prosecuted for simple possession, they're prosecuted for other offences as well. So um, I haven't got a disaggregation of the figures in relation to that. But I can, I can chase that up. Yeah, no, the figures are kind of startling because since uh, 2021, uh, there's been... 5,000 people issued with a caution in terms of simple possession of cannabis. But then for the same amount of cannabis for simple possession, that figure is 17,500. So it's extraordinary, really. And that's why I'm kind of, I have huge criticism of terms of uh, the lip service in terms of uh, harm reduction and um, so forth. Just getting back to uh, the kind of, I suppose, the hub of this issue. In terms of what we're talking about, we're talking about controlled drugs, we're talking about heroin, we're talking about crack, we're talking about cannabis. Uh, these are all controlled drugs, but can somebody tell me who actually controls them? Because I know who controls them. It's not yours, it's not the state, it's criminal gangs. So as long as they're controlled by criminal gangs, we're gonna have a problem. Because there's no regulation and these people don't care. These, these people just, you know, they profiteer from, um, you know, misery in some cases. So as long as that exists, we're going to have the same conversations constantly and constantly and constantly. So there has to be a kind of a, a paradigm shift in terms of who actually control these drugs. Because there will always do, be a demand for drugs, regardless of whether we agree with it or not. So can somebody ask me, can somebody ask me this question? Who actually controls these drugs? These are controlled drugs. It's, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, the people who obviously manufacture and, and distribute illegal drugs are criminal gangs, and it's, it's an illegal activity. I mean, if you're talking about drugs like heroin and cocaine, um, as, as Eamon has said, you know, most of the heroin production in the world was coming from Afghanistan when the Taliban were facilitating it, and then after they, they stepped down. So if, if, you were, if there was a suggestion that you know, the state to take over um, the production of drugs in, a, in some form of legalisation, you would have to engage with the countries and entities that are in regions where, where those drugs can be produced. I mean, these are, these are plants, essentially, uh, that don't grow everywhere. Uh, opium production, if you're looking at coca leaves as well, you have to engage with the Taliban, you have to engage with, with narco-terrorists in, in, in Colombia. So it's not as simple as saying the state just, just takes over production um, that's that's just not not practical. Um, if, if that's if that's my, my the point is that if you continue the policy of criminalisation, if you continue the policy of um, no control whatsoever, right, and no regulation, then you will continuously have this debate. Continuously, right. So I would argue. The best, a better approach, and I think, I think the majority of people actually would agree in terms of decriminalisation of the drug, uh, you know, the drug user, right? I think that is, uh, that's a shift in public opinion. 
But you, I think you even need to go beyond that, and you need to look at elements of legalisation and regulation. Because if you don't have that, then essentially what will happen, and is happening, is that criminal gangs will control the drug market. And as long as that happen, happens, then you will have the complex uh, issue of, you know, our prisons are three quarters full of people that are in the drug industry. So you will have this, these issues that we're trying to, trying to resolve and trying to uh, address. You'll constantly have these issues unless you don't talk about the elephant in the room. If you don't talk about that, we're going to be back here in the next 10, 10 years, talk about the exact same thing. Um, well, in relation to, to legalisation, um, we do look at what other countries are doing. We are looking at the situation in, in, in Canada and the United States and so on to see what kind of uh, outcomes they're having in relation to that. Some have reversed their, their moves towards legalisation. There are where, issues where... Which country, which country is that? Uh, well, the state of Oregon is, 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 is moving the opposite direction. Canada is considering moving back as well. So there are, there are steps being taken by some where they have seen unintended consequences. So... For example, as well, the cannabis production, uh, the, the Mexican cartels, what, what the guards have been hearing from their contacts in, in the DAA, is that they are still producing large volumes of it. The people who can afford to go to licensed premises to purchase cannabis are people who are more affluent. Um, so the, the, the drugs gangs are still targeting people in American inner cities and are still supplying them. So they are still involved I mean, in the supply. black market will probably continue. Even if it's uh, and the control market. of the black market and will still be maintained the by black organized criminal still gangs. Alcohol and tobacco, even though they're regulated and they're legal. So there'll always be a black market for these, these drugs. But as long as the state completely kind of uh, shuns its responsibility around regulation, we're going to have this conversation in 10 years' time and people are going to die. Simple as that. Thank so you. This, is the, this is the question we have to ask ourselves. Thank you, Deputy. Um, there's lots in that. I'm going to ask a few questions um, as well. Um, I suppose, you know, we do have clinical grade drugs that hospitals use that don't have to engage with, you know, the Taliban, you know, when we look at actually how all medicines are made. Um, so I think there might be um, maybe some questions around um, whether that's actually an accurate representation. Um, we have stuff like heroin assisted uh, treatment programs in other countries and stuff, and I'm sure that they're not engaging with the, the, the Taliban in relation to clinical grade heroin in, in relation to, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure I could be corrected on that, but my instinct would tell me that that's not the case. Um, I think does it, does it, does, there's something that I'm not understanding that's undercurrent, which is, I suppose, the, the resistance to answer Deputy Kennedy, uh, Kenny's very first question is that the Drugs Act has criminalised people who use drugs and, and, and people who experience addiction. And I'm just wondering if I can put that question back. I think it's a very, very simple question. Um, and I think if each department and the HSC can just answer that and, you know, the Drugs Act... Um, forgetting prohibition and legalisation, just the Drugs Act, Section 3, in relation to the Drugs Act, has that criminalised people who use drugs and people who um, uh, uh, experience addiction? Section 3, um, yeah, it makes possession of drugs illegal, so people who yeah. have yeah. Know, are reached Section 3 have got criminal convictions as a result. And from the, from the, the Department and the HSC? I think it's... Logical. Yeah, Grant, it's just to kind of set that, because I didn't know what yeah. the... I didn't understand if why you would it's think... A, if it's illegal, then you're arrested. Exactly. It's a so, crime. So, I mean, it's logical that if there's an act and legislation and the person yes. is in breach of that legislation and, and, and they're charged, that they will be... Criminalised. Criminalised. Exactly. So it's just to kind of... I, just, I didn't Sorry, understand I, what I, was I happening there. I don't think we fully understood. Okay. The, and I think then just like to, for that to act as the basis then is to also then look at this idea of, of a health aversion. I think we need to be very, very honest that the current model which is being worked on is, um, is, is not decriminalisation. And I'm wondering as well if, the, if there's an objection from any of the departments to decriminalisation in, 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 in it's safe to keep it simple, the repealing of Section 3. Is there a departmental objection to decriminalisation? Um, in relation to, to um, in relation to maintenance or otherwise of, of uh, Section 3, I suppose the, the starting point really is, is around um, effectively what, we're, what we've heard say from Garda Shikhan on the ground is that they utilise 
Section 3, uh, and often as a result of Section 3, they find Section 15 offences, or they may find other offences as well. So by, by removing Section 3 completely from the statute book, it would greatly reduce their capacity to identify Section 15 offences. Okay. So that's, that's the, the kind of the underlying yeah, and, and uh, issue in relation to I think it's good to have that in the record. I think as legislators, that's something that we need to work around is that, you know, the, the idea that stop and search would be the barrier to people who experience uh, addiction not being criminalised for a broader purpose of being able to just stop and search carte blanche because of section, uh, uh, because of that section that exists within the Drugs Act. It's, a, I suppose, using people who are in addiction and people who use drugs as a way to find other crime. And I think that from, from that basis, that that's wrong in and of itself. Obviously, just the legal questions about how you still ensure that the guards are empowered to pursue um, any other crime that they see fit, but that also decriminalisation shouldn't um, be kind of put in the bin because of those other questions. And what I'm wondering then is in relation to um, the health aversion piece or, you know, the two strikes, because... Even if we look at mental health, right, and in many cases, you know, there will be dual diagnosis. In many cases, a lot of people look at um, addiction at certain stages also as, 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 as a mental health issue. Um, obviously, there's lots of different models in the way that people want to look at things. Um, but we, we don't mandate people into care, in, in a sense, right? And addiction, obviously, um, as you will know, is so complex. And I think if the threat of, um, you know, one caution, two caution, and then you're going to be criminalised, that that's somehow going to increase um, the, the, the health interventions where somebody actually leaves addiction is, um, you know, I, it, it, it's disingenuous to kind of see that as a health diversion. I think everyone should have the option, obviously. You shouldn't be criminalised to access a health uh, 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 thing. And obviously someone should be offered um, health diversion if they are stopped and searched. But the idea that they then would be criminalised, I think we would have a lot of people not dead and a lot of people not in addiction in our, in our communities if the threat of a criminal sanction was the thing that stopped them being an addict. <laughs> Do you know? And I think it's not that simple. So from the, the Department of Health and maybe the HSE, um, can you maybe speak a little bit to what is the evidence of criminalising a person in addiction um, if they're caught in possession? for drugs for their own use. What is the medical evidence and what is the medical rationale for keeping a, a criminal sanction on the statute books that criminalises them? What is the actual health outcome for someone? I, I, sorry, I can speak to some of that. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Senator. Um, so the, there was the working group that was set up as part of the, uh, the National Drug Strategy to look at the um, alternative mm -hmm. approaches to personal possession. There was... Uh, kind of policy debates, there was research done by um, uh, some people that were commissioned by the working group and there was also the public consultation and then after that there was a range of three I think policy options were recommended to the government <clears throat> and the governments uh, decided to move forward with the health diversion scheme. So in that respect it's the health led approach in, in an awful lot of respects it, 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 it then therefore leads to the health diversion scheme. So in terms of the the arrest, I think, and the uh, it, it's an opportunity for members of Angarda Shikana to divert that person. Yeah, but the work. actual threat of the arrest piece. So arresting yeah. somebody, can you tell me how, what is the evidence and the health rationale? So this is the Department of Health. So can the Department of Health state how arresting someone for personal use, whether it's the fourth time or the twelfth time, if they are in addiction, can you tell me what the health benefit is? and what the evidence is that supports that that is good rationale from a health perspective? Well, it, not so much the... I mean, I think the health benefit is the person is then... And just to kind of speak to something else you, you said just a moment ago, while the uh, referral is made, the person it's non-mandatory for the person to turn up to that say, referral. So, you know, they, they'll, be put in connect, they'll be connected with the health services and then possibly onto other services such as dual diagnosis, homelessness, and other challenges that person might be uh, facing. But it's not mandatory that they... You know, engage in that respect. In terms of the evidence base, I'd have to revert it. I mean, there's a working group report, there's a government decision around that, and that decision was made, and then we're kind of implementing Yeah, but I'm more talking about the Department of Health. So a Department of Health, you would imagine, would be health forced. So a Department of Health, I would imagine, would see that arrest and the criminal justice system is not a health response, even if a health diversion has been offered once or twice because addiction obviously is complex. So I'm wondering from a health-led perspective how criminal justice at all 
even factored in to a health department response is an evidence-based health initiative. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to go back and look at some of the rationale that underpinned yeah. the original report and revert you on that one. I don't have an answer right now. Okay, thank you. I've, I've gone over my time, so I might go, I might go um, back around. I think Deputy Ward is up first. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Um, just four, sorry, um, four minutes. Oh, four minutes. Yeah. I, I'll just keep it to the Department of Justice on this one. So I've, I've zero, zero interest myself in criminalising people who, who are in addiction for simple possession. But I do have an interest in tackling those uh, in organised crime who are making money and making fast amounts of money on other people's misery. Like young people, especially in, in disadvantaged areas in my area, they're attracted by the lifestyle with the flash runners, the, the fancy cars, the few bobs in their pocket. And they, and they see it, whether they, see, they know they see it or not, as a way of escaping out of poverty. Um, CAM was set up to tackle high level organised crime and, and to take their assets, and it was a, it's a really welcome tool of the state. But there's a cohort of drug dealers that are underneath <coughs> that, that their lifestyles do not match their means. And you just have to go on social media and you'll see it. They're out eating in fancy restaurants, they're going to constantly to football matches, they're probably over at the Euros at the moment. They don't have the assets, but they have the lifestyle that doesn't match their means. Last week, at the citizens, when the Citizens Assembly were, were in here, they mentioned um, a community kind of local level cab. They, were, they, they mentioned that as a, as, a, as a recommendation. We didn't get a chance to tease it out. I was just wondering, has the department given that any consideration um, on a kind of local kind of uh, cab, and um, would the cab then be able to tackle lifestyles as well as um, assets? Because I think that is something that needs to be tackled. I use the GA analogy when they're when they're trying to attract more young girls into sports. If you can't see it, you can't be it. It's like that, that lifestyle. If young people can't see it, they may not want to be it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, it has been given consideration, and as a result of that, um, a network of asset profilers uh, exists within Angarda Shiokana around the state. So people have been specifically trying by cab to identify that kind of mid-tier uh, range of, of drug dealers and look at assets that they have um, and try and target them and go after them. So as part of that, the, the threshold levels uh, of which cab could seize goods or cash was reduced to, to 5,000 and 1,000. Um, to go after that kind of range, okay. and, and CAB have had a lot of success then as a result of, of those reduced uh, thresholds, where they can go after people who don't yet have the you okay. know the, 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 the mansion with the reinforced windows or whatever, but you know the mid-level okay. people who have and, BMWs. And, and, and what about, what about what talking about lifestyle? People with lifestyle, but the lifestyle of being able to go over to any soccer match they want over across the water, or to go eat in any restaurant they want, probably not walking or if they are walking, they're not in a job that where they're the means match the lifestyle. Have the Department of Justice or have the guards got the ability to go after them people to say, how are you, how are you, how are you funding that lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's there. I mean, the reduced threshold levels, I mean, valuable goods up to, up to um, I can't remember if it's goods 1,000 and, and, and cash 5,000 or the other way around. I can, I'll get that for you, Deputy, though. But at that level, I mean, that will target these kind of things. It's hard to get. A, it's hard to take back a hundred, a hundred euro steak after it's been eaten. So that, that's what I'm talking about. The lifestyle itself. It, and, it all builds and, a picture, though. It stuff. all builds a picture, and yeah. it gives the guards the evidence that they can go after somebody. Then they're okay. able to build a profile. They're able to make that case. They're able to go in and say, "This is the proceeds of crime. This person can't finance that kind of lifestyle." So this is all uh, of evidential value when they're going in to make the application okay. to freeze assets and freeze cash. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question, just because I've limited time left. Um, the, the new law that's come, came, that came in recently in relation to coercion of a minor, um, I was wondering, has anybody been convicted of that yet? Or has any cases been taken? Uh, not yet, no. That's only very recently introduced. I mean, there, no, we haven't seen any... Uh, it'll take time before we see... We see uh, and and will, will, will it, do you think the way it's, way it's written and the way it's laid out in legislation that it will be a useful to a tool for the guards and the Department of Justice to go after these people? Based on what we've seen uh, through the Greentown programme and through the trial sites, um, we're confident that it should it should yield um, it should be a useful tool for the guards to be able to go after these people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Fitzpatrick. Yeah, uh, Kirlock. Um, for the Department of Justice, you said earlier when you were talking about the community safety partnerships that the community safety partnerships had had excellent results. I wonder. And we've only three fifty-one minutes. Uh, three minutes now. Um, can you send to us some documentation outlining how the department has concluded uh, 
an excellent outcome um, of the community safety partnerships, particularly from the north inner city, when what I described to you and what others described to you certainly doesn't sound like excellence and doesn't appear like excellence um, to, to our community at all. Um, so I'm interested to really understand how that excellence is being measured. Um, in terms of the section three, I just want to get back to the conversation there. You know, there's there's two sides to this argument. On the, on, on the one side, it's that the guards need the section three to be able to intervene in a first instance, and that ideally leads to a referral to a health support and an intervention there. But the other side of it, I suppose, is, is that it's immediately uh, introducing a criminalization element and, a, and, a, and everything that goes with that for an individual. So has the Department of Justice with the Gardaí done any work in examining and uh, trying to assess what the impact would be of doing away with that uh, Section 3, taking away the, um, that criminalisation at that point, and how that would actually work in practice uh, then uh, with, for the Gardaí. Like if, if it was to be taken away, that simple possession was no longer a criminal um, event, a criminalising event, um, how would the Gardaí um, then operate in terms of trying to uh, tackle uh, drugs and drug abuse? Um, yeah, in relation to the first comment on the, the local community safety partnerships, we have um, we had them evaluated all through the process. So the initial baseline evaluation report was published, the interim evaluation report was also published, and the, um, the final evaluation report uh, has either been published or is about to be published in, in the next couple of weeks. So um, there are documents out there which evaluate the, the programme, and I can um, send into the committee, if required, specific examples in relation to any of the partnerships and some of the activities that they've done. Um, on Section 3 and doing away with Section 3, um, Ty referenced the, the work of the, the Joe Sheehan, uh, led group which was looking at different approaches to drug use. So we do, as part of that process, we did examine jurisdictions that have done it, tried to look at how they could apply in an Irish context. Um, and there are, there's, there's deliberations within that report about the pros and cons of that. So um, we can furnish a copy of that report to the committee as well, if that's useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just, just in response to, to your query, um, I just wanted to point out that access to drug services aren't only through the route of being referred by Angarda Siakana. We have open access, self-referral, mm -hmm. and there are many channels whereby people access services, whether it's through going online on the drugs.ie, whether it's access <coughs> through the HSE website, or through engagement mm -hmm. with healthcare professionals, or even family and loved ones. So our, the, the, the publication of that map of services is targeted particularly for people to find that just on their phone. It could be a family mm. member who's worried about a, a somebody within their family with problematic drug use or mm. alcohol use. It could be their GP. It could be somebody within the, you know, the health service itself. Mm. So, so just in, in, just to make sure people understand that you know it's, mm. there isn't only one channel. In fact, that would be a very minor channel mm. of access, and we would encourage anybody who is concerned about problematic drug use to avail of those resources <coughs> because they are available across the community. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's it. Okay. Um, Grant, so I'm going to move on to Deputy Gold. Yeah, good morning. I suppose for the Department of Health, <coughs> last week the Citizens <coughs> Assembly were in, and one of the main, one of the recommendations is around support funding uh, for uh, drug services, for recovery services, community, education, all these. Like, unless we have the funding and the resources and the services in place, we can implement um, or we can't deliver a new drug strategy. That's my belief. I don't like. I believe at the moment the, se the sector is chronically underfunded, um, and to be honest, I think that there's this is uh, a failure of government, and has been for for years, to to support uh, addiction services, uh, drug and alcohol task forces. Like their funding is their funding is shocking for the work they do not giving them multi-annual funding. So, like, if we're going to, if we're going to be serious about a drug strategy, we have to start off at the, the basics, and the basics is services, funding, community, recovery. That's where we need to be putting money in. And just in relation to a reference you made earlier of an additional 13.5 million in 2023 and 2024. Now, to me, this is a tiny amount compared to the level of need. 
uh, how much did the interactive map cost? A third of the money is allocated to community voluntary groups. Where does the rest go? And my last question in this section then is, why wasn't funding provided to reopen Keltoy? Was it a HSE decision? Was it a Department of Health decision? Was it a government decision? Why isn't Keltoy open? Um, so I might take the, the breakdown of expenditure on drug services is broken down across a number of, of major categories. So the HSE addiction services account for about 45%. Community-based services, so that service is provided by the community and voluntary sector is about 39-40%. GPs and pharmacy, they represent about 15%. This is based on 2022 data. And then the HRB, the Health Research Board, who provide all that gathering of information and do the underlying research, they accounted in 2022 for about 1% of that funding. In the period since 2022, there has been a 12% increase in funding in drug services. Um, and, and I welcome this committee and particularly the attention of the Citizens' Assembly to what is a really important topic. And I think there is a significant stigma for people around accessing services. And as uh, Professor Keenan said, we don't see very long waiting lists for many of our drug services. And that tells us that we need to increase the awareness um, if there are people out there who are struggling with problematic drug use and don't know where to go, when we see things within our health services like increased waiting lists or higher demands in one part yeah, of the country... J than just, the other. Uh, just to correct something there, and apologies for interrupting. Yeah. Uh, we've got figures there, I don't have them with me today, in relation to people trying to access detox, rehab beds, uh, residential beds. There's a huge shortage there. So for anyone to say that does not, is not correct, uh, these are figures I got from the department and from the minister. Like, uh, we need a massive rollout of beds in that sector. And also, the, the situation around people accessing treatment, people have to pay uh, a fee. So if you have a person who's in that, person, in that position in time who wants to seek help and support, and in a lot of cases there's a fee of 90, 100, 120 euros, like these are vulnerable people. If they had that type of money, like, um, like number one, anyway, access should be free and open. Uh, and, and also, we need more beds. So I, I just, I don't accept the point that's being made. There's not a backlog there. So, so what, what I, I mean, Deputy, is that when we see areas that are under pressure in terms of higher demand, we put the increased funding towards those. So, for instance, we've, in the, in the current year, we've uh, increased <coughs> the funding to dual diagnosis services because we know there is an under-delivery of services for people who are coping with, with both addiction and mental health services. We now have a model of care which tells us what good will look like and we're now rolling out the provision of those services both for adults and also for adolescents around and um, in different hubs around the country so what I mean to say is when the evidence tells us that there is an increased demand or there is a growing need for something that's how the funding is also being allocated but I welcome your proposal around the how does that increasing and Sally I'm just conscious of time and apologies how does that tie into Keltoy not being open and why you want the Keltoy question Question over to the HSE colleagues. Yeah, and we, uh, there are plans. Uh, yeah. Professor Keenan will outline the, the progress made on, on Keltoid. Thank you. So, the Sean has mentioned the National Dual, Dual Diagnosis Programme. So, uh, Keltoid is proposed to be the HSE National Dual Diagnosis Rehabilitation Centre. Uh, it's That centre was recommended in the model of care that was launched in May 23. And it's been going to be used to re rehabilitate those people with serious and significant mental health and substance use disorders. It's going to be a national service. It's going to accept referrals from across uh, uh, the country. Mm -hmm. So this is planned as a partnership between HSC Social Inclusion in, in CHO9 or Dublin North City and the Dual Diagnosis Clinical Programme uh, for the HSC Mental Health Services. So the staff who were employed in Keltoy previously are going to be working in the new dual diagnosis clinical programme and there was a meeting with Minister Butler uh, and the National Dual Diagnosis Clinical Programme in the department uh, where they put forward proposals uh, for uh, a day service or a residential service. Uh, and Has that decision not been made? The resources haven't been provided. Um, like, um, apologies, no, sir. Why have, like, have resources been looked for or have they been denied? The resources have been sought. 
So the government, this, like, I don't know if I understand, so say or no. Oh, is the reason Keltoy not open is because the government is, hasn't given the funding yeah, to the open The reason it. it's not open is that we don't have the resources to uh, repurpose but, 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 yeah, just, just in relation to the model of care, a lot of work has been done in terms of the emerging issue of dual diagnosis. The model of care has outlined a re really good uh, approach to this. Uh, the submissions have been made in terms of the resources and they'll be considered... Um, when? Well, Siobhan, I think they, they'll be in yeah, the normal estimates process. Yeah. Well, like, Keltoy has been closed a couple of years now. It was closed under the guise of COVID. Then it was used as a, a COVID centre uh, for, uh, for marginalised and vulnerable people. Right? And like, to be honest, I, th I, I think this is a sham. I'll be honest, I think this is a sham. Like, I, I just want a straight question now. I think it's an opportunity. I think the model of care in terms of dual diagnosis is really important. Uh, and I think the model of care well, is really And listen, I agree with you 100%. I just want to know... Is, uh, yeah, and I'll, 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 I just want an answer. How, has money been applied for and who hasn't given the money? The money has been applied for and the application is under consideration... By the HSE? By the department. Money has been applied for by the by HSE... The, by the, department, the department, department. department of Health. Is yes, that correct? are considering that proposal. Yeah. So, uh, Chair, I think this is shocking. I tell you. Agreed. Um, um, uh, Deputy Horgan, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just take my four minutes to talk about potency a, a little bit, the potency of, of drugs. But before I do, I just want to return to the issue of Oregon uh, reversing some of their work on decriminalisation, because I think it's important that we put on the record that when, when they took that action three years ago, it, in, it, it interacted with, uh, I think, a 13-fold increase in drug overdose due to, due to fentanyl, um, which I don't think anybody who would have engaged in that lawmaking could have envisaged. And also, the legislators themselves said that there's an interaction with homelessness. So one of the problems for Oregon is that they have rampant homelessness, and there's no way that one, one of the ways that they dealt with that was effectively by putting people into the system and without without relying on drugs to do that and, and drug possession to do that. They had no way to effectively move people on within communities if they were homeless. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, say, say that a little bit because I've been following the Oregon thing very closely. Um, so I, 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 one of my interests here is the change in potency. And we've talked a little bit about um, uh, the change, I suppose, in the type of drugs that we're seeing um, and in synthetic drugs. But also, you know, in the last few decades, we've seen an, an increase in potency in drugs that we are m more familiar with, like cannabis, for example, and, and I believe, you know, seven to eight times more potent. And that's before we start looking at the addition of, um, you know, more psychoactive substances. Uh, I think it's called poly substance use, where you're, you're kind of adding bits together. So I know the HSE is doing work on... on uh, monitoring um, potency amongst um, uh, all sorts of substances, but I'm just wondering from a justice-led approach, when you're, let's say, stopping and searching for standard possession, uh, what's the approach from yourselves? Can you just like walk me through what the approach is to understanding and documenting the potency of particular substances? And what's the kind of communication and interaction between these two groups? Yeah, well, actually... It's very helpful to have Angarda Shikana here to, to talk through that because they're the, the actual operational people on the ground. Um, essentially, if Angarda Shikana sees drugs from somebody, it will be sent to Forensic Science Ireland. Uh, Forensic Science Ireland will, will analyse the drug and will uh, report back. There's good engagement with HSC in relation to particularly... Um, on the, Forensic on Science Ireland is doing it on the basis that uh, like a file has been sent to the, the DPP and there's going to be a, a, a prosecution. Um, yeah, it's been seized as a result of criminality, so that it's sent to forensic science for analysis. Yeah. Right. And so, can I ask you, in the case of a particular substance, uh, if the potency is considered to be particularly high, as opposed to a, a less potent version of the same substance, does that impact the conviction? No, the conviction is is for type of substance, yeah. not the potency of the substance. Not the potency. Okay. Um, can I ask then, in in the context of um, a, 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 a sector that has seen potency exponentially increase and all of the problematic impacts that would have on people. Can I ask all three groups maybe, do you think that the current legislation um, is suitable to deal with that issue? The current, the current 
legislative approach, does, does it address potency? Um, I, can, I, I think the answer from you, Mr. Ryan, is it doesn't at all. From our point of view, it doesn't. But justice led approach is illegal. It doesn't it's matter to justice. Yeah. If it was 1978 and you had a joint and it was <coughs> one level, and if you get ar arrested in 2008 and it's eight times more potent, it makes no difference to justice. No, the substance is illegal, so the possession of the substance is illegal. Uh, the impact on the in person order. is completely different. You, you take that point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Perspective. I think um, what we have seen is when there have been new drugs have come on the market or impacted on people, say like crack cocaine, we have an obligation then to respond and adapt and ensure we are providing and working with the HSE. To what you mean responses. by that is if there's a new drug, you put it onto the list of controlled substances and it's now something that would be recognised. I suppose what I'm asking is if there is an existing drug where the, the nature of that drug is changing out of all recognition. How are your current policies addressing that? So the policies haven't adapted to that, but they're more around looking at the impact on the service users and the people, the services that are dealing with people impacted by those drugs. So okay, but how, how, do you, how do you look at the impacts without looking at the potency? So for, so, for example, if all of a sudden the type of drug, which is a drug that we were familiar with for decades, changes to the point where it is eliciting health outcomes that weren't envisaged, how do you do that without, without so the considering the potency? So the policy itself is broad enough. So it doesn't, for instance, I'll give the example of the synthetic opioids. That change around naloxone and broadening the, the training role of the HSE is an, is an example of how working with the colleagues in the HSE and other agencies, we, we use the broader lens of the policy to be, to be able to adapt. So the, the policy itself doesn't exclude us or preclude us from being able to respond in a more agile way to that change. But of course you can't regulate any pot potency in any way. No, no. You have no control. No. No control. Okay. And maybe to the HSE? Does that lack of control concern I, you? I, I think uh, mainly our, our concern is providing people with the services and giving them access to the services so uh, and responding to the needs as they're presenting and as we said at the outset it's a very complex and fast-changing environment. I mean, Professor Keenan might want to come in uh, in terms of some of the initiatives, I think, that have been outlined today have um, facilitated that uh, adaptability in terms of addressing what are kind of very uh, changing uh, uh, issues within society. So, sorry, what you're describing is at the end of a process or at the end of the imbibing of a substance that we are recording and then, and then responding. We talked about the upstream factors <coughs> and having a comprehensive, holistic approach to addressing substance misuse, uh, particularly as it inter interacts with environments where you have poverty, let poor education, uh, and uh, environmental factors. Uh, so I think a lot of the contributions this morning talked about that upstream, uh, importance of that upstream work in terms of prevention. And indeed, even at the recovery point, Professor Keenan made the point that it's really important that there are options available for people during the recovery in, in terms of education, employment, support for families. Okay. Uh, so I think that's really where we're coming at. I'm going this. to have to move on, Deputy Shannon. I know Mr Keenan is looking to come in. I just want to check if you're OK for him to respond. Is that OK? So yeah, just in relation to the potency issue, yes, that is a, a factor for the HSE because with the higher potency substances, we get more referrals. So if you look at what's happening for our service, uh, for those under the age of 25, um, the, the substance that is causing the most referrals is cannabis. 40% uh, of our referrals are in relation to cannabis, and that's uh, been increasing year on year as a result of the increase in potency. So that has a knock-on effect uh, for health, uh, and we have to respond to that because we are the treatment providers. Thank you. Uh, and just, um, it, just in relation, you talked about the labs, and I just want to mention our National Red Alert Group, which for the first time now we've got the labs to sit down with us around the table and work collaboratively in relation to the responses around nitazines, because I think you're right in that previously 
uh, analysis of drugs were done on the basis of a prosecution, but we really need uh, much greater uh, emphasis on uh, the analysis of the content of the drugs uh, to see uh, potency, uh, to see uh, are there any other contaminants, and that's what the National Red Alert Group that we're the HSE are chairing. Uh, we have the the laboratories. We have Angarda Shikana. Uh, we have the HSE Emergency Management. We have the ambulance service, and we have the emergency department sitting around the table looking at these emerging trends. Because you're right, all of these new substances are creating lots of difficulties, and we need to know what they are. Okay, thank you. Let's go to your deputy Shanahan. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Sir, could I just go to uh, Ben in the Department of Justice, please? Uh, just in relation to. Um, uh, the programme that, that um, Senator Fitzpatrick had uh, discussed, this inner city programme, yeah, we'd be interested to uh, get the information that she requested when you can, and you just to provide exactly what's happening there, as you said, uh, the excellent outcomes uh, that you're seeing there. Uh, just in terms of the community safety partnerships, I have some knowledge of, of this, an actual um, a past secretary of, of the Department of Justice, Sean Aylward, led out in Warford on this, but I noted your uh, comment where you said that you were um, hopefully looking for a local leadership programme and, and for people to kind of step forward. And I just put to you, uh, that's not very easy to do in terms of um, uh, community involvement, particularly where there's rife drug dealing going on. I think you know there's very significant personal safety issues there for anybody, uh, particularly just a member of the public, trying to combat any of that. So I'm not quite sure what that is going to look like, but I wait to see. But uh, could I ask you just in terms of, of the department's opinion in terms of trying to deal with the whole uh, issue of drug supply into the country? And others have spoken here about the difficulty of trying to tackle organised uh, crime. But obviously the supply has, has a, um, is interdependent on the price, and, and we've seen it in past years when the price of drugs have risen. Uh, you know, it has had an effect on, on, on consumption. Uh, but just a couple of things you'll be aware of, of um, uh, the recent talk of defence and our defence uh, situation in Ireland, our Navy in particular, we have no ability to interdict drugs coming into the, uh, being landed in, in the south coast of Ireland. We've seen that a number of times. Just wondering what the Department of Justice uh, thinks about that in terms of our defence budget, because we haven't really uh, done anything. We've had three ships tied up in Cork Harbour there for past months, unable to go out to sea because of a lack of, of recruitment and a lack of workers. The other thing I would say to the same is true in terms of Angarda Shikana and the recruitment program. And again, we're hearing about the churn of new Gardaí who are uh, you know, passing out and not staying in position because of that. So again, wh where is the Department of Justice speaking to government on this? And can I ask you all about cab activity? Uh, and I think we all remember Faulkner Murphy and Barry Galvin at the time when cab was set up and the stellar victories that they had against organised crime. But it appears to me that, that the situation has now changed. Organised crime is much more organised, unfortunately. Uh, there's very effective telecommunications and IT systems now at play. And we even see you know, a long-running saga here of a crime family overseas who cannot seem to be apprehended or brought to justice for, for uh, their involvement in, in drug dealing. So just I think the department has a very important role to play here. I don't think it, I know it. And, and obviously your statute is that as well. But could I ask you just to maybe speak to a few of those, please? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shannon. Um, in relation to, to drug seizures and um, large seizures of, of drugs transiting through the country, through the South Coast in particular, um, I'm not going to comment on, on anything to defence with respect, if that's OK, or defence budget. But um, in relation to Angarda Shikana, they have seen significant seizures and significant uh, successes. Um, so as recently as, um, I think it was February, the joint operation between Guardian and Revenue in Cork, uh, there was a seizure with an estimated value of 32.8 million of synthetic, synthetic opioids. So they are, um, they are seeing successes there. Um, obviously, we'd like to see more people in Garda Shikana. We have been assisting them with, with um, attempts to increase recruitment, increase throughput through Temple Moor. It is a challenging recruitment environment at the moment, not just for Angarda Shikana, but for any employer. There's much more fluidity, much more mobility. People take a job for a couple of years um, and, and decide they want to broaden their horizons and do other jobs. And that's, that's, that's not unique to Angarda Shikana. That's, that's the case across the board. We have it in our department. I'm sure every other government department has it as well. 
the, the kind of job for life uh, career attitude is, seems to have disappeared largely. So despite that, we are, we are doing everything we can to support and guard Shia Khanna in, um, in increasing recruitment and, and budget has been provided to them to do that. In relation to, um, to CAB, I mean, CAB have continued to expand their efforts. We continue to try and support them in, 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 in adapting to the change in model of organised crime. So um, I mentioned um, in response to Deputy Ward's question, actually, it was, I wasn't clear on one point. It was, um, it's been, the thresholds have been reduced to assets of 5,000 and cash of 1,000 since the Process <coughs> Crime Amendment Act in 2016. So that's the target to kind of the mid-level foot soldiers as well. But uh, the, the, you've talked about people operating and controlling things from other jurisdictions. We, you know, we have been um, collaborating with other jurisdictions to try and, and, and formalise extradition treaties, mutual legal assistance treaties. We are, um, we are getting really good cooperation. Um, we're very happy with the level of cooperation we have. These processes take a significant amount of time. Different legal systems, different language issues, translation issues, and so on. Um, we have to make sure that if someone is to be um, formally sought to be extradited back to this country, that it, the case is absolutely watertight and legally robust and there are no technicalities that someone can get away with uh, in relation to that. But extensive work is going on in that regard, both between ourselves and Garda Shia Director of Public Prosecutions and, and Department of Foreign Affairs. So there are concerted efforts in relation to uh, international cooperation to target drug dealers operating abroad. Uh, I think they were the, the three points you asked me to come in on. Yeah, I, I, I just think, and I'm not on favour with the latest um, initiatives from your department, but I think it's a significant part while we're trying to talk about how we might solve at the consumer end what's happening in the drug space. Unfortunately, uh, it would appear that the volume of drugs coming into the country is increasing. And I point out to you that, that one of the high-profile drug seizures that you mentioned, it was said that that was actually the fourth one of those that had been done. So three previous ones of that scale had come into the country, how much of it is uh, coming through here and is transiting on uh, to other countries is another question, but a significant amount of it is obviously destined for the Irish market, unfortunately, and, uh, and as I said to you, you don't wish to comment on, on what our naval assets can do, uh, but if you're dumping drugs at sea, which is what's happening, and, and, uh, and we don't have a, a way of interdicting that, that's, that's a significant uh, policy deficit, in my opinion, and one that needs to be addressed. Um, I think there's there's some good research from I think it was the one of the I'll have to I'll have to find it but it's on drug markets and how they're um, no matter how many interventions or seizures that happen that it's such an intelligent market that um, it doesn't actually you never interrupt the market do you know what I mean it's so it's so big and I think sometimes what we see from my from my perspective what we see is you know wins when a seizure happens is that actually it, 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 it corrects itself so quickly that it's not really felt on the ground or you know it doesn't remove um, substance or at least it does for a little while uh, you know obviously sometimes there has been scarcity of, of, of certain types of drugs but it's an intelligent market and there is I think it's John Collins has done research and stuff on it it might be just something beneficial for, for the committee to read um, I just had two questions um, for, uh, two questions for, for Mr Ryan and two for maybe Mr Keenan and, and then um, we'll, we're going to go into a final round just of brief comments because we do have till half twelve but I may need to leave within that and Deputy Ward is going to just take the chair for me for the last ten minutes um, so t two, of the, two of the questions I have come up from just two comments from earlier when we talk about the, the, the statistics I suppose that uh, Deputy uh, Kenny gave in relation to possession still being at such a high number right but then I think also Assistant Commissioner um, Kelly was noted last week and you've just kind of said the same thing there is, oh, but they were also being prosecuted for other stuff. I think that's a bit confusing because does that mean people who are being prosecuted for other stuff are not entitled to the adult caution scheme or not entitled to... So if, if they've other charges well, then they would be up for the other charges. Why are they up for the cannabis? Do you know what I mean? Like, why are they not being uncoupled? So then it's, a, it's saying that if you are being prosecuted for any other thing, you're not actually entitled to the adult caution. Is that correct? It's, it's not exactly as, as, as cut and dried as that. So it will depend on the nature of the other offences. If, if there are other low-level offences, um, 
it's possible that someone, the Garda can use their discretion to allow someone to avail the allocation scheme. But if they're more serious offences, then it will be taken into consideration. So the allocation scheme isn't, isn't aimed at people who are involved in more serious offences, such as Section 15 will be the main one in this regard. So if someone is also being charged with possession with intent to supply of, of a particular drug and may have a small quantity for person possession of a different drug, then they wouldn't be the, uh, considered suitable in public interest test around um, suitability for adult caution. Okay, so there is lots of caveats maybe that are unaware of. So there, is there an audit being done of what, what all those people that are being done of the, uh, those 70,500 that Deputy Kennedy, Kenny speaks about? Is there an audit of what other prosecutions that they're actually being done for at the same time, which makes them in um, not meet the criteria for adult caution? Uh, not currently, no. Okay. Um, the second question is in relation to the grooming piece, and I suppose I've always very personally had an issue with this because, for me, poverty and the environment is the grooming uh, is is where the grooming happens. And um, but yet we seem to want to kind of target particular groups and say, no, you're responsible for the grooming of this age group or that age group. And I'm wondering then, within the policy or within the legislation, is there the possibility that an 18-year-old can be charged with the grooming of a 15-year-old? It is possible. So what we've what we've um, done is that where the other person is a minor themselves, because we are aware of instances where 16, 17 year olds are, are have been conditioned themselves, and then are grooming other younger kids. That the legislation won't apply to them. So where a minor is grooming another, but an 18 year old or upwards, it is, it is possible. It's, it, I would see that as extremely problematic. I suppose when you look at the nature of some communities, their access to youth work. How we even on a youth work perspective, we see young people as up to the age of 23. You know, you don't just go from being a child to an adult, and you know, so the the actual sequence of grooming is a little bit complex in the mm -hmm. sense that you have just a lot of people who live in the same community who are being given the same access to the same, I suppose, illegitimate a resource of, of, of making money. Um, so I think I've, I've viewed questions around that. I think then just in relation to um, maybe um, Professor Keenan or, or, or anyone really in the HSE, in relation to the naloxone, and we've talked a lot about training, I'm not sure if it was mentioned around where, where we're at in relation to over-the-counter naloxone. Um, and who, what decision needs to be made for that to... Because I, I know training might be important, but if we do obviously have the nasal, um, ax, you know, nasal naloxone, it is much easier to use. So where, where are we at with access to naloxone over the counter? The department? So it is... I'm not a clinical person, but um, naloxone is, is, is only permitted in, in to those who are... Um, for whom it is prescribed, yeah. and then... Um, but it, it's a controlled... No, I know, controlled. but the department, I know, um, I, I, I had a commencement matter recently where it was said mm -hmm. that the department was moving to over-the-counter access. So I'm just wondering where over-the-counter access yeah, we'll is. Yeah, give you an update. I'll come back to you with an update on the Can you please? Of that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. And just to say one thing with the training that, you know, now that the HSE is a recognised trainer, so if somebody... Uh, or an organisation that can do training and then they can apply to the HPRA to get uh, the naloxone into their premises. So yes. that's where we've been working with the PEAs and with the hostels and that sort of thing. So take Simon or something like that, that they all get trained with the HSE naloxone programme, yes. they then uh, up, get the licence from the HPRA to hold it on, so, so that say, improves say, the say, fit. Say even on the street, so say the other day, it was about a week and a half ago now, I encountered a, potent, a, a suspected overdose, I wouldn't be mm -hmm. able to tell obviously, but I suspected that it was, checked her no naloxone. Mm -hmm. I have to say the experience was really actually difficult because nobody even wanted to help me put her in recovery position, they didn't even want to touch the girl. It was really, really horrible experience to see. I'm used to overdoses. I've dealt with them many, many times. Mm -hmm. I was definitely not used to the on-street experience. One older lady actually came to help, to help me try and keep her up straight um, while I negotiated with the shop to ring an ambulance, like it was a negotiation that, that she should have an ambulance arrive. Um, so for me, in that situation, it's even, you know, being able to run into a chemist and access the nasal spray. Um, obviously, you're taking a risk, whether it's an overdose or not. There could have been anything wrong with, wrong with the girl, but, I mean, it's not going to cause any harm to her in, in relation to that. And I think it's, it's so important that we do have so many people on our street that may not even be in a service and that we can access... Um, the naloxone and then finally um, I apologise um, for going over time but when we talk about options in recovery and it goes right back to the very 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 first comment from yourself uh, Mr Keenan where you were talking about um, the response to like when someone's coming off methadone and you know needing those options needing those supports and um, being able to fill I suppose even the gap that access and a service used to fill it whether that be education whether that be employment and I'm just wondering then 
when we look at options, um, is, it, is it then also noted and acknowledged that those options are massively decreased with a criminal conviction for possession of drugs, which cannot come off your convictions for your, your vetting forms? So they'll stay in your vetting form, on, in, in line with murder, sexual offences and gun crimes, they'll remain there. So somebody that is looking to access a particular um, source of education or particular employment is actually excluded from full recovery in that regard in relation to criminal conviction in many cases. Obviously not all. So in, when we talk about options, do we need to acknowledge that a criminal conviction and the current legislation reduces the options in recovery? A criminal conviction can have an impact on people's employment, travel, and uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's it. Um, I might just maybe, like, a, I suppose, a two, three minute round, if we yeah, can yeah, keep yeah, it, wait, wait, especially wait. you, Mr. Gould, um, <laughs> if you can keep it to two or three, but we'll go now, to If we go all, we haven't meant over one chest here, so we'll do it this time. <laughs> No, I, 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 have a, I have a comment and a, a, um, a, probably a question as well. So just on uh, just Department of Health, I went on the interactive map of addiction service myself this morning before I came, before I came in. Now, I did find it a little bit clunky. I'm sure that it's probably still a work in progress and I'm not the best when it comes to IT in any way. So, but I did see there was a, a duplicity of services on some of them things, so that's just uh, for, for, your, for your attention. But I had a particular look at residential services and to my surprise, when I looked at the residential services, Keltoy was listed as a residential service on the map. And as we know, Deputy Gold just mentioned as well, it hasn't been opened in, I think it's four years now. Um, we've had debates with um, Minister Fian, with Minister, uh, Hildegard Norton, the, the Minister for um, Health, and they all gave commitments that they were going to open it back up. So just listen to what, the interaction between the HSE and, and Deputy Gould there. The, the book seems to be stopping with the Department of Health for the reason why it's not back open. Can you comment on that, if that's the reason? Is it resources that you haven't got from the, from the government, or is it you prioritise resources somewhere else? So I'm just looking for the reason why the money hasn't been prioritised for Keltoy. So I'm not aware, and, and apologies, I'm not aware of the specific um, referral in relation to Keltoy into the department, but I can speak to the um, investment in and the requirements for investment in dual diagnosis services. And, and part of the Sloan to Care um, theme is to ensure that services are delivered at community level, support, supporting people who live in their own homes yep. and ensuring they have access and, and, and then stepped up and all the way and through I've limbed, to I've limbed the time, so just on that as well. Before it was a dual diagnosis service, yeah. it was open for other people as well. So, for example, if you were doing a methadone detox in Kundara and Cherry Orchard, they, there was a door-to-door -door service where you went to a detox in Kundara and you started your rehabilitation journey in Keltoy. Mm -hmm. And that's the bit that's missing in the jigsaw for people, that they finish their detox and they're more than likely going back out in the community now because the, that space is not there for rehabilitation. So that's another piece that needs to be looked at outside of dual diagnosis. OK, and we'll revert to you just in terms of the funding application and the status of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Deputy Gould, please. Yeah, just... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, are you looking forward to seeing that? No, really, because... Um, I think it's, uh, there's no excuses acceptable for the delay in not reopening Keltoy and not having it um, a residential care as well. Like, I'm not looking for the 9 to 5 Monday to Friday, that's not going to run here. So I just, and I, so I think that note, and to be honest, um, I, I'll be talking to uh, David Cullinan as well about this because we, myself and Mark, and other people have been given statements and comments about Keltoy for the last number of years now. And I'm actually shocked, to be honest, that you've come in here today and no one can tell us how much funding is required and when it will be open. It's, it's unbelievable. So I'll just move on. Uh, in relation to the lockdown, and as the chair said, uh, I've met with groups, myself and Dahi Doolan went around Dublin, we met with different groups who were actually um, so you'd step in the systems so they could get naloxone to people who needed it. It was unbelievable. Number one, anyway, I was really impressed by these people, ingenuity, right? These addiction service groups in Dublin. Like, um, we know naloxone saves lives. Like, uh, what's the issue here? Like, we, we need to get this out to a broad uh, people, family members, uh, communities, where people are at high risk. So uh, I'd agree with the chair. I think, um, listen, I know there needs to be training, but there's no point, and as the chair described her own circumstances last week, like, uh, I, I'd imagine if Naloxone had, had been available, 
that she would have uh, well capable to deliver that to that person who was potentially at risk of an overdose. Uh, just in relation to the Department of Justice, um, could you give us figures in relation to um, outlining the number of young people brought through the Youth, Devention, youth Diversion Programme for drug, drug Possession? have specifically for, for drug possession. So we have the numbers on the number of people who go through youth diversion schemes nationally, but it's not separated out into, into what particular offence or what, category, what, what number of offences. Yeah, I'd request that we do that because like, you have you've different issues here, right? But if you're looking at young people who are at risk uh, in relation to drugs, I think we need more. It's all about the data. The data will tell us what we can do. So I would request that. And the last question then, Chair, for the Department of Justice again. Uh, are you in a situation in Cork where a person was selling uh, these kind of new uh, psycho uh, psychotic drugs? Uh, I contacted the local Gardaí. They felt they didn't have the training to prosecute under the criminal justice. Um, I contacted the minister who told me that a letter was sent out detailing the, the act. And as, as far as I know, it's not even uh, Gardaí aren't even getting the training in Templemore. So, um, like, have we a situation where right there, this person was selling products um, from her door for months, if not years, and the Gardaí couldn't act because they didn't have the training. Uh, it, it, has that been resolved now at this stage? Um, I'm not sure what the what the specific issue is around the training, so I'll have to I'll have to inquire with Gardaí Sheikh Khan. I'm not sure what issue they've raised, so I can't say whether it's been resolved or not. But do you know these new these new products, these new. Uh, Synthetic and uh, drugs that are coming on, uh, because like these were the ones in the head shops. Remember, there was a gap in the legislation there where head shops were selling these. Um, no, the loophole was closed, but the Gardaí field, the Gardaí I spoke to, and in oh, Cork, that didn't have the um, didn't have the training. The normal Gardaí on the beat didn't have the training. So I think that's something that should certainly be trained to Gardaí in Templemore, and not a letter. You know, a Deputy, um, Deputy Horgan. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, um, I, I want to turn to the issue of, um, I suppose, supports for people recovering um, for addiction. So this is mostly to the HSE and, and the Department of Health, um, because obviously I represent Dublin 1 and Dublin 7, and there's a huge amount of um, addiction supports, you know, while you're in active addiction, I suppose. But then following from that, uh, Thankfully, we have a housing first strategy um, and you're finding people in placements, um, often in placements in private accommodation, but then sometimes in placements um, that are effectively being operated by AHBs. And I'm just wondering, um, A, could you outline, I guess, the framework and, and the communication between AHBs and yourselves in terms of ensuring that people in housing first are getting support strategies? Like, I know that there's... Uh, community workers going in and checking on certain people, but I also know that some of those placements are, you know, in some cases chaotic, in some cases, like I, I have people coming into my constituency clinics um, saying, you know, that they'll have a placement like that and it will attract, um, you know, possibly other people who are in addiction and it becomes problematic for, for people in housing. So I'm interested in what's the live conversation between AHBs and the Department of Health or, or the HSE in supporting somebody who's recovering or even who's in housing first programs but it is in active addiction. So there's that first part. And then the second part is that, not to put too fine a point on it, but some parts of the country, like Dublin One, uh, have a very, very high provision of those places um, and are increasingly being put under huge pressure. And I'm wondering, is the Department of Health tracking the management of provision across all of the provision by the DHRE, by various charities, by the HSE directly, so that we have a, a live action map of there are this many people in Dublin 1, there are this many people in Dublin 7, there are this many people in Kerry, there are this many people in Limerick, because I very much believe that some communities are bearing more of the burden than other communities. So those two aspects. Go to Joe, who uh, um, from our National Social Inclusion Office. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Deputy. 
We, we work in partnership, as you know, with the, with the Department of Housing, um, who have given the responsibility of oversight to the housing agency. Um, so that's all coordinated in partnership between the housing agency and ourselves. So there are nine, there are nine housing can I, areas. Can I stop you there and, yeah. and just outline that for, you, for me? Yeah. There's you got, so there's Department of Health, right, yes. where the money starts. That's point A. We could go back to deeper, but we'll start at point A. Then point B is yourselves and the HSC. Then you work with the Department of Housing. Then housing puts the housing agency into the mix, and then the housing agency goes to the AHB. So we have we have an over we have an oversight committee that's co-chaired between the Department of Housing and the Department of Health. Um, as part of that, uh, targets are set uh, for the housing agency to take up tenancies across the country. And they're agreed with the with the local authority areas. The HSE, in partnership with the local authority areas, uh, develop up plans then to to service uh, and support people who are in the housing first tenancy uh, program um, around case management and access to to health services. So and the, so then, are you tracking how many placements are in each area and if it's appropriate? The we would know we would know through the local authorities where people it's the yeah. it's the local authorities so you know where they are but yes. you're not making any judgment call on whether that's an appropriate provision in an area well the, as i say the the program itself is is very much fluid and we're working together <laughs> together together with them yeah but is my characterization of the euro that starts with the department of health goes through all those stages before it gets to the service user no, the, the, there's funding provided to, to the HSE to support the Housing Force programme. But you guys go through the Department of Housing? And we work with the Department okay. of Housing. And then, sorry, from the Department of Health, are you monitoring how many placements are in each area across every single service provision? So we, we are part, as, as Joe would have said there, yeah, the Department of Health sits on that oversight committee. We take the actions or have oversight with the HSE in terms of delivery of the, the target for the particular year. And we have ongoing engagement with our colleagues in the Department of Housing outside of that structure if there are any issues uh, ongoing nationally. But just to say one of the things about the supports, there is the immediate supports to support a person in the tenancy, but there is also the role of the support around mainstreaming and pathwaying people to the services in their local area. So we're so for each individual, okay. they may... I know I'm way over the time. I know, to... Chair, but can I just yeah. say one thing? Are, are you saying to me then that you have a sense across all the service providers that, let's take Gardner Street, for example, there's, let's say, 320 of these placements on Gardner Street and what kind of social impact that's going to have on Gardner Street. Is anyone in the Department of Health doing that? At the moment, it would be within each integrated health air care area. The answer is no, is it? But so, so it's not... It's yes and no, can I say. So, so we work closely with the HSE in terms of how they're delivering on those uh, pieces, on those targets for their particular regions or particular CHOs. But we do have a gap in terms of the data sharing. So you have pointed to an issue, which is we don't have single identifiers for people who... In certain areas. So if everybody ends up in Gardner Street or, or it, that's just look at the draw. We are reliant on the local community health care organisation or local health the, lo the local community health organisations are telling me they have no control because the money comes and nobody is saying this street is over over, yes. hey, over the top. There's, there's Thanks, Deputy. There's, there's various different agencies Dep depending on which which. I know, that's the yeah. So for Dublin, for example, there there's one agency currently providing housing housing force for for the for the Dublin area. Um, so basically, that that agency would know where all the placements are. And the I HSE. might disagree with you there okay, within gone. your narrow definition, but I can tell you that that's not really how it works on the ground. There's multiple agencies who are putting basically transition places, units in place, and, and it's all being focused in one in certain areas. Uh, housing force in Dublin is provided by one agency. Thank you. Um, so we've come to the end of our session. Unfortunately, Deputy Gould, if I open it back up to you, I'll have to open it back up to, to everyone. I just have and one question. Is the yes or no answer? Um, only if your colleagues agree that they're not going to come back in, and if you keep it to one, if you keep it to one sentence. Yeah. Well, I welcome the news that the, the supervised uh, injection facility will be open in quarter four, 2024. <coughs> uh, my question is: Have you considered giving um, 
providing safe consumption rooms, and is there any timeline for delivery for Cork and Limerick? Ever, Margaret. Part of the, the purpose of the review is to identify how well it works and, and who, you know, how it serves those communities. And absolutely, this is a pilot. Um, we know from other jurisdictions that this kind of harm reduction measure is an important tool in, in the overall toolbox. And that if we're seeing the same needs arising in other parts of the country, yet yeah, we will absolutely have to actively consider it. You know, Mr. Keenan, very quickly. Yeah, just very quickly. So it, the legislation only allows for it to be an injecting facility yeah, at the not consumption. Um, but just one thing there's been a lot of talk about naloxone uh, this, uh, this morning so I would just like to say that the HSC would be happy to offer all the members of the committee training in naloxone uh, uh, identification of overdose and uh, using naloxone That's very appreciated and I think um, we'll definitely write to the members of the committee and see, see how we can organise that, it's, it's very useful um, so I think um, that was a, an extremely informative morning. I think we, we got through lots of different issues, so I thank everyone for their patience and for their latitude in terms of, in terms of time. Um, so I'd like to thank our, our witnesses for engaging with the committee today, your contributions and answers um, have obviously given us a lot to think about. And